בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. Um, we're back to our uh, Florida שיעור Wednesday nights, just uh, landed a few hours ago from uh, the New York trip. ברוך השם, it was a successful trip. Lots of uh, new faces, a few old faces, ברוך השם. Uh, people watching our שיעורים on- online. Uh, today's שיעור... Uh, will be for a uh, refuah shlema for uh, Levana, Rabbanit Levana, Bat Sarah, for Serach Bat Batya, Batya Bat Sarah, uh, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, uh, Rabbanit uh, Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Dvora Bat Mercedes, Esther Bat Zipporah, and all of Am Yisrael Bezat Hashem will have refuah shlema, refuah tanefesh, refuah taguf. So, uh, as I said, the uh, couple of days we went to uh, New York, Baruch Hashem, it was worth the, uh, the effort and the uh, physical uh, anguish I have to go through flying. It's not much fun. Uh, I don't know, it's nice. some people, Baruch Hashem, most people have healthy bodies, so flying for them is uh, a breeze. For me, it's a kaparat avonot, but uh, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, the reason why is because the Chida, the Chida says in Berkei Yosef, Or HaChaim, Siman 290, that uh, that a person that listens to Musar from, uh, directly from the Rabbi is, not, is nothing like someone who simply reads Musar. Needless to say, watches Musar. And the people that uh, came to the shiur that have been watching my uh, shiurim for a few years, some of them have been watching since day one, several years already, six years. Uh, some have been started a few years ago. Some started only a few months ago. And uh, each one of them always starts the uh, conversation that way. It's uh, being in the shiur is nothing like uh, watching a shiur online. Uh, this just uh, when you're watching a shiur, you're getting educated, Baruch Hashem, as many people watch online. And Bezat Hashem will continue watching online. But uh, when you come to the shiur and you actually pay attention uh, and you're, you're, you become part of the shiur, you simply become part of the shiur, suddenly you see that the rabbi is saying things that are directly impacting your life. Suddenly you see that the rabbi is uh, saying things that are answering the question that was in your head. You didn't tell the rabbi, but he already answered your question. This is all called Siyat uh divine assistance. Uh, the rabbi gets when uh, he's looking to help you and you're looking for help. You know, a bali ta'er mesayim v'yado, the Gemara says. Someone that comes to become purified, a kadosh baruch Hu gives him a hand. Meaning that if a person really truly comes to become purified, he's coming there or she's coming there, in order to learn, in order to become educated, in order to improve herself, in order to improve himself, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give the uh, speaker specific things to say that he didn't plan on saying, that are particularly answering that person's questions or solving their dilemmas. But it says, Abali Tameh lo. Someone that's looking for uh, you know, obstacles, is looking to make sins and things of that nature, Hashem also helps him too. Meaning if a person is coming to just try to interfere or he's trying to see if, uh, you know, if he could find something that the rabbi did wrong, or all types of things, Hashem will even help him too. Why? Go dig yourself a hole in Gainom. You know, and this is a, the answer to um, many people, Baruch Hashem, over the last uh, several weeks, I guess it's been even a couple of months, have uh, woken up from their, uh, from their slumber. Uh, in regards to uh, several issues, one in particular has been this Rasha Merusha, uh, Manus Friedman, and uh, of how uh, he distorts the Torah in practically every single one of his lecture. But uh, unfortunately, you see there's still many people defending him. Uh, most of them are uh, ignorant as can possibly be. Uh, they don't know an ounce of Torah. Uh, they don't know a lacha at all. But the best part yet... The best part yet is that you see the superheroes that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, they want to rebuke me, you know. So what do they do? They make comments on the, on the Internet saying, 
uh, making fun of me, calling me all types of names, or insulting me in other different ways, and saying, why? Because they're saying, oh, why? Well, how come you didn't talk to Manus Friedman before you made the videos? Like, if they thought about what they did for just one minute, not like the whole day, just one minute, they would see how stupid they are. And there's no other word to describe such people. You can't say foolishness. Foolishness is too polite. Outright stupid. Why? You're, te- you're rebuking me. You're telling me that I should have called him. Which, by the way, this whole thing has been going on for several years. People think it started two months ago. But we'll get to that in a moment. But just to understand the level of stupidity in this generation... You're rebuking me publicly. You're calling me names. You're saying I'm a chilul Hashem. I'm the worst. I'm a lake. Whatever you want to say. Because under your understanding, I didn't speak to him. I didn't speak to him beforehand. Before publicizing his own clips. I didn't, I, I didn't create clips. I publicized his own stuff. So I'm bad. While you're doing it to me. How come you didn't contact me before you went public against me? Why, I'm less of a Jew? What, his Jewish neshama is different than mine? That's how dumb people are. That's how dumb people are. Gemara Masechet Shabbat says, En adam roi chova be'atzmo. A person does not see an obligation in himself. He'll murder somebody without having a cause, without having any substantial evidence whatsoever, just based on an assumption. Why? Because... He thinks he murdered somebody else. The, 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 the beauty of, of, of Akadosh Baruch Hu, how he directs these people to dig themselves a hole, is unbelievably precise. I mean, it just, it's unbelievable. You, make, you couldn't even make up a story like this. And it's just one after another. Just before this lecture, somebody sent me a lecture. Somebody sent me a public comment by uh, a guy that I was actually relatively friendly with from uh, a goy that uh, helps Rabbi uh, Tobias Singer. His name is, um, I forget his name, he has a show called Tanakh Talk. It's Tanakh Talk, but he calls it Tanakh Talk. And, uh, you know, we, I was actually on his show some years ago. And apparently he went public against me. Right, uh, apparently today, I guess. Uh, and uh, because, you know why? Because he's friends with Manus Friedman. He's on his show. Uh, he asked me to be on a show, but I couldn't commit. But that's a different story. But anyway, so he goes public against me. How come you didn't? Because, I, because under his understanding, I didn't reach out to Manus Friedman. Under his understanding, I didn't reach out to Manus Friedman. So, therefore, he's allowed to go against me. But how come you didn't reach out to me? How come you didn't reach out to me? How come you didn't do what you're blaming me to do, that I'm doing? How come? Because you're a hypocrite. Because you don't see the obligation yourself. When you look in the mirror, you see everybody that's behind you. Now, the next thing, I've said this once, I've said this twice, I've said this a thousand times. There is a difference between going against someone personally and calling them names and insulting them, which is in essence what these fools are doing against me, and warning the public from a danger. Now, if you saw your child go into the electric closet and start playing with the wires. And you said, honey, can you get out, please? You are a horrible parent. Horrible. Terrible. You should be put in a, in a, in a, in a uh, bird cell just to be with the birds. Go talk to them that way. Why? Because it's too far gone. The kid is inside the electric closet. There's no time to be polite. You have to get him out of there, whatever measure it takes. He's in life danger. But that's only physical flesh. That's only physical flesh. If you have countless, tens of thousands of people in spiritual danger to go to Gehenom and never come out because of their heresy, because they're listening to a false speaker that distorts the Torah, never provides a single source for the life of it, when we asked him for sources, he rejected our request. In one particular uh, uh, case, he actually says, I don't disclose my secrets. We asked them for sources. No, I don't disclose my secrets. This has been almost three years in the making. I've been trying to be quiet about this for three years. 
hoping that we can solve this issue and not go public. People think I have some type of agenda going against people in public, like I'm bored, like I get anything out of it. Oh, you're trying to become popular. Trying to become popular? I don't need to try to become popular. I'm trying to help people go to Gan Eden. I don't need to try to become popular. Baruch Hashem, I'm already relatively popular. But nonetheless, I don't, it's not because I tried. But fools say, no, no, you're, 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 uh, it's because you didn't listen, you didn't hear about, you didn't learn Tanya. How do you know I didn't learn Tanya? Well, you come to my house, you see my books. If you come to my house, you see my books, you see that maybe, maybe you're wrong. In fact, you watch my shiurim, you see that uh, we have one particular shiur that used over 1,400 sources from Hasidut. That's a few more sources than just Tanya. No, you don't understand Hasidut. How do you know what I understand? Assumptions and insults and all types of things. Why? Because it's an inconvenient. Oh, no, you don't understand him. If I don't understand him, that's a problem. That's what the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says. Chachamim, tizaru bedivrechem. Wise men, you have to be careful with your words because you can lead your, your students to gain on the Mishnah says. If I don't understand them, then honestly, and none of you are going to understand them. With all due respect, none of the people in the world, uh, that are watching on YouTube are going to understand if I don't understand them. Not that I'm the smartest guy in the world. This is what I do all day. If you spend 20 hours a day being in the Torah, then maybe you have uh, a lot more than uh, knowledge than I could ever have. But uh, if you don't, then most likely you're not going to understand more than me. So if I don't understand, who's going to understand? Pikachu. Or the, the little minim from, from the movie. Well, who's going to understand if I don't understand? But that's where we double check. We go to our rabbis. We ask them, do you understand? He doesn't understand. Robert Fryman doesn't understand. So what? If Robert Fryman doesn't understand, he's also an idiot? He also doesn't know what he's talking about? He's also clueless. He doesn't know Hasidut now. You're gonna say you're gonna say Rabbi Fraim doesn't know Hasidut either. He learned with the Hasidim for almost twenty years, but he doesn't know Hasidut like uh, like Manus the Menace? He doesn't know. You know more, you you little YouTube listener. You've been watching Shurim for two years. You know more than more than him, more than Rabbi Fraim. Has over ten smichot from the Rabbanut, the head rabbi of of of, of, of Israel. Said this, you from now on you have to call him a gaon, but he doesn't understand. You call him a gaon from now on, but he doesn't understand. And what about the rest of his kola? The entire kola was asked this question. Dayanim, Tamide Chachamim, one of them is one of the head rabbis of Yerushalayim. They asked him the same question. Do you understand? Rav Gidon ben Moshe said, I don't understand. They told Rav Gidon ben Moshe one time, listen, uh, here's uh, blood. From a woman, is this nida or not nida? You know, for for uh, family purity, some 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 superhero tried to fool him. He says, "This is my wife. Is she nida or not nida?" Rav Gidon ben Moshe looks at it. He goes, "What are you trying to make fun of me? This is from a tooth. The blood's from a tooth." The guy's face dropped to the floor after 15 minutes. He picked it up. He goes, "How does the rabbi know it's from a tooth? It's blood. How do you know it's from a tooth?" He says, go, go, go find your friends. Go find your friends. What do you think? You're going to fool me by showing me blood? You think that I don't know what blood comes from here? It's to you, it, you don't know, because you don't know anything. Someone that's been learning with the Gdole Adol for 60 years, you think he's the same as you? So if he doesn't understand what Manus Friedman says, you understand, YouTube listener? You little Mr. Facebook Live that you have a little uh, Yud Kevav Ke on your post over there, you think it's a mitzvah to put Hashem's name on your Facebook? You have no idea that the Gemara Masichet uh, Ta'anit says you have no share of the world to come for doing it? You don't know how to say Tfilat Aderich, Tfilat Aderich. Oh, what's Tfilat Aderich? You don't know that and you're the, the, the prayer you say before you go on a trip. 2,000 amot out of the city. You know, no, you don't know. Oh, but you know, you know more than, more than him too. More than the entire colon in, in, in Arnof. This, the foolishness of people just jumping. Why? Emotions. Emotions. They're very emotional. They assume everybody's wrong. They assume everybody else knows less than them. And that comes from ego. That comes from ego. So last, last time, the story of Manus Friedman is almost three years in the making. We have tried everything possible to, to get information from this clown. 
and I have to call him a clown because that's what he is. Anyone that knows an ounce of Torah, watches his shurim, sees the guy, is an outright stand-up comedian. That's what some of the Chachamim says. Is, he a, is it really a rabbi or just a stand-up comedian? Because that's how he acts. He acts like a stand-up comedian. Says, there's not one shiur that anyone has watched has mentioned one source. When the Mishnah in Avot says you have to mention sources. You have to mention sources. Now, if you don't want to mention sources, no problem. Can I get the source after? So we tried getting the sources. He tried to convince us to sign up to a membership, so pay him $5 a month to answer his emails. $5 a month if you want me to answer your emails. If that wasn't enough, he says, no, okay, so what about a meeting? Okay, I'll meet with you guys, $400 for a half hour. No, we just want to know one source. Here, you said this. Where's the source for this? Oh, I don't disclose my secrets. When I spoke to his son, not the one that molested children, by the way. You know he has a son that molested kids, right? Oh, you guys don't know this? You don't know he has a kid that molest- has a son that molested children? He made fun of child molesters. He made fun of people that were mo- not child molesters. He made fun in 2012. He made fun of, uh, of, of somebody that asked him, listen, Rabbi, uh, what if, uh, you know, someone, which I'm assuming the guy was talking about himself, what if someone was molested when he was a kid? 2012, this is public knowledge. 2012, what if somebody was molested by somebody? Should he tell this to a shiduch? So he responds to him, he goes, if you had diarrhea, would you tell it to your shiduch? Like, well, it's not a problem. He starts making fun of it. He's like, ah, listen. At one point he says, there's no yeshiva kid that hasn't been molested. Hashem yishmor v'yatzil. Hashem yishmor v'yatzil. If you think this is the standing yeshivot, you should shut down every single yeshiva in the world. Throw every rabbi in the world in jail, if that's what you think. He makes fun of it. They went against them. He removed the video. You could still get it online, but it look, the looks are horrible. You could just hear the voice. You hear everything I'm telling you. It's not a made-up story. 2012, it was a big balagan, but he paid a fortune to get this removed. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, what does Kadosh Baruch Hu says? Mechalel Shem Bashem Baseter. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, if you desecrate Hashem's name in hiding, he exposes you. He exposes you to the public. How? Five years later, one of his ten sons, like the ten sons of Haman, one of his ten sons was caught molesting a kid on Shabbat. He was a teacher in the yeshiva. He was a teacher in a, uh, in a uh, uh, camp. By the way, guys, please do me a favor. Don't send your kids to camp. There's just too many horror stories. It's, a, it's my mask, like 50-50 if he's going to survive as a normal kid. It's not worth it. Don't send your kids to camp. It's just too many horrible stories. I cannot, uh, people ask me, do you know of any camps? No, I don't know nothing about camps. Don't say, I only know bad things about camps. That's all I know. This guy was a camp teacher. They catch him with the kid. Not like the kid came. No, they catch him with the kid. And then the cops, goes on the news, goes on the news, said there's at least three cases. But for sure there's going to be more from this guy. But if you look him up on the registered sex offenders list, you're not going to find him. Why? Lots of money. Makes the story disappear. But Baruch Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't let stuff like this disappear. But a guy that makes fun of child molesters, his son ends up being a child molester, and then someone said, you know what, maybe uh, there's something there. They said, listen, he, the child molester, he was molested himself also, which is very common, by the way. Child molesters end up being child, uh, uh, were molested themselves. I just wonder who's the molester. I'm a vin yavin. You still want to defend them? A person speaking like this to the public? Oh, you didn't know? Now you know. What do you think? I go against people because it's a hobby? It's a danger to the public to listen to things that he says because they're against the Torah. Not against my opinion. And then people start sending me shiurim. Look, this rabbi spoke about it. Spoke about something similar. Three hours shiur, two hours shiur. I say, hey, listen, I'm not going to listen to three hours shiur. Give me a source. Give me a page number. I have plenty of books in my house. Give me a page number. Give me a source. Where does it say what he says? No one, not one person came with it. Not a single person comes with a page number. Everybody just says, no, no, you, if you listen to the shoe, you'll understand. I don't want to listen to the shoe. I want a page number. I want to read it with my eyes. 
Where does this clown get it from? Where does that clown get it from? They're saying the same thing. Fine. Where do they get it from? Oh, no, he said it. So what? If he said it, does that mean it's true? If I say something, that means it's true. I provide, I provide you guys sources. Don't trust me. Trust the Torah. You don't trust the Torah. We have a different conversation to have. But the point is, Rabotai, is that people think, no, no, because it's their favorite rabbi. Therefore, it must, you must be wrong. You must have an agenda against them. What agenda do I have against anybody? Unless you're against the Torah, I, have nothing. I don't care about who, that you exist, Bechlal. Why does it affect me? What does it affect me? What, do you think he's stealing YouTube listeners from you or something? Like, like as if, what, uh, YouTube sends me less than zero than it sends me now? We don't have advertising on our YouTube. We're not making money off of you. What's, what? I don't understand. Where do people get this? Like, where do these juke him, these little bugs they have in their head? Where do they get the idea that, that there's like an agenda here? If you're against the Torah, I have an obligation to warn people. Because if they listen to you, that means that they're going to get punished. I love Am Yisrael. It's the only reason why I do this. I love a Kadosh Baruch Hu, I love Am Yisrael. No offense, I love Hashem more than Am Yisrael, but that's okay too. That's why I do this. That's why there's a shield today. Just landed a few hours ago. It's not, it really wasn't supposed to be a shield, but I said, ah, we haven't talked to you in a few days. We have to learn something. But Ribbono Sholam, people come out and they start attacking you, contradicting what they said themselves, with no sources, with no backing, with no nothing. And unfortunately, people fall for it. Oh, look, he's talking against him. Oh, like it's like a, like a boxing match. If a person says things that are against the Torah on purpose, not a mistake, on purpose, not on one occasion, on multiple occasions, things that will lead them to sin, such as the thing that he said that no matter what you did, Hashem is not going to punish you. Why? Because we've been in the exile for 2,000 years, we've had the Holocaust, and it doesn't matter if you keep or you don't keep, He's not going to punish anybody. Or that it's not our fault that Hashem has, uh, you know, came to Mount Sinai, you know, uh, uh, and then he left and hasn't wanted to speak to us in 3,000 years. Things like that, these are things that are against the Torah. These are things that are against the Torah, and there's countless other things we haven't even mentioned that he says under against the Torah. I just, I'm tired. I'm tired of listening to it. I feel like I'm becoming stupider every time I listen to one of his clips. It's like you, have, you listen to one 5-10 minute clip, you have to do a tikkun, tikkun chatzot, tikkun this, tikkun that. You have to do all types of tikkunim just to get it out of your system. I'm tired of it. I don't want to listen to any more of his clips. And mamash, IQ drops 5, 10, 20% just from 5 minutes out of this guy. I can't, I can't handle it. It's mamash too much. It's like listening to Christianity. And that's the reality. So if a person says things that are against the Torah, you have a moral obligation, a biblical obligation to publicly go against this person. You do not need a beddin. You do not need the whole world uh, and all of the rabbis in the world to say, yeah, you go against him. You don't need that. Why? Because he's a public speaker. He's a public speaker. He's hurting the public. He's a public speaker that's hurting the public. He's a machtiya rabim. A machtiya rabim, you're not allowed to give him kafschut. Not allowed to give him the benefit of the doubt. He doesn't have the regular traditional things applied to him. The Rambam says such a person does not, Hashem doesn't even allow him to do tshuva. I already know a bunch of people that have gone off the derech, that have become secular atheists because of him. That's the thing that pretty much kept egging me on to look further and further into this before we finally went public. One after another is going off the deck. I said, what happened? Why? Oh, look at Manus, what he said. He said this and he said that. It doesn't make any sense. It contradicts the Torah. So Manus must be right. So the point is, Rabotai, is that if a person is doing things that are against the Torah on a public level, of course you should always double check with your Rav and even with several Rabbanim. But to think that you need a psak din to do such a thing, I don't know where anybody got such a thing. Uh, to think that, uh, that uh, 
uh, you need to be, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what people are thinking anymore. But the point is, is that if a person is a massive murderer, you know, he's murdering people on a massive scale, there's no room for you to be patient and, and, and hope that everyone agrees with you that he's a murderer. You have to warn people. You have to warn them. That's the key. If I didn't warn you, you continue listening to him and you continue having false ideology. Little by little, people have completely different religion in their mind. That's the whole point. There's no agenda. There's no money coming out of it. There's, it's other than headache, nothing else, honestly. Other than headache, nothing else. I've spoken to people. Oh, this is the next thing. Oh, you should speak to real, uh, to real Chabadniks. They'll tell you. I speak to real Chabadniks. And guess what? They have much worse things to say about him than me. Much worse things to say. They tell me this guy is like the Tzarat of Chabad. But how come he's still invited to other Chabads uh, that he gives big lectures over there? Because they're on his team. There's, unfortunately, there's a couple of parts to Chabad for anyone who doesn't know. Not all Chabad is the same class. Not all Chabad is united. Even at 770, there's already a uh, 10, 15 year lawsuit between the two big sides of Chabad. The Messianics and the non-Messianics. Lawsuits, and even after the, uh, the, the, the normal ones, the good ones, one, the Messianics refuse to leave. And they force their false beliefs on people. They put flags all over the streets of the uh, Rebbe's Mashiach. And you have to be a believer in the Rebbe or else it's uh, this or that. You know, Christianity all over again, 2,000 years. Christianity remix. So the point is, I've spoken to real Chabadniks. They have many, many things to say worse than me, but they don't speak publicly. So, you know, this is, this is you know, I'm, 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 the, uh, I'm, I'm the messenger. I ask him, how come the big guys in Chabad don't speak against? He goes, ah, we ask the same question they tell me. How come the big Chabadniks don't speak against those whole messianics? He goes, ah, we ask the same question. How come this? How come that? How come they don't speak against Shmuli Boteach? Ah, we ask the same question. There's a lot of questions about Chabad as far as what's going on here because the reality is you have a few people that Baruch Hashem are fantastic human beings. They know what they're talking about. They're really seriously learning Tanya, seriously learning what the Lubavitcher Rebbe says, seriously learning what all of what all of Chassidut, all Shuchan Aruch, the Rambam, and so on and so forth. And then you have a bunch of Ame Aratzot, complete ignoramuses that unfortunately some of them are very, very famous creating new laws, new religions, new everything every other day, sell millions of books, and completely full of falsehood. And no one says a thing. Every other day, the Shmuli Boteach comes out with another, uh, another disastrous announcement. Nobody says a thing. Manus Friedman, every few hours, not every day, every few hours is a new video. There's not a single video that you'll find as kosher if you know what you're talking about. No one says a thing. So no one says a thing. The, the, the Mishnah says, Makom ish, ish ish. A place there's no leader, you be the leader. We think this is fun. I'd rather, I'd much rather talk to you guys about other things. But unfortunately, what are you going to do? You have a bunch of people that are being led astray and it's a dangerous situation because we already have enough problems. We already have enough problems. If there is a person that's speaking things that are against the Torah publicly, you have an obligation to do something about it. You cannot sit quiet. It's forbidden for you to sit quiet. It's a sin for you to sit quiet. What's the source? Several sources. You have the Alakha, Ocheach Tocheach et Amitecha. Then you have Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah. Then you have Gemara Masechet Shabbat. Then you have Sanhedrin. You have several places that talks about the obligation to rebuke when you have the ability to. Meaning, when you know someone is sinning, you have to do something about it. If you don't, the Gemara says the sin goes on you. If you know your friend is sinning, and you know that you have the ability to influence them a little bit, influence her a little bit, but you don't do it. Why? Because you don't want to ruin the friendship. Because you think, you're assuming it's going to ruin the friendship. You don't say anything. You see her driving on Shabbat, you don't say nothing. 
Gemara says the sin goes on you. Both of you go up to Shemaim, you're both Mechale Shabbat. Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah, one of the Tanaim, one of the Tanaim almost went to Genom for this because he didn't rebuke his next door neighbor for, uh, Gemara Shabbat says this, is a, uh, he didn't rebuke his next door neighbor for uh, how she treated her cow, that her cow was carrying bells on Shabbat and he didn't rebuke her because she was a widow. After he found out that he was wrong, he fasted for the rest of his life until all of his teeth turned black. For not rebuking one time in his life. People do this every day like it's a, like it's a mitzvah. And that's for one person. Then the Gemara continues, if you are a person that has the influence of a keilah, of a community, but you don't rebuke the community, the sins of the entire community go on you. And then the Gemara continues, says, if you are gadol, meaning you have the impact to influence a generation, and you don't rebuke the generation, the entire generation's sins go on you also. Not that they don't have sins. They also get punished. But nonetheless, the person who doesn't rebuke, he gets everybody's sins. So if you have a following, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200,000 people watching your shiurim, that means that you have a reach. Maybe not the entire generation, but that's your reach. Your 10, 20, 50, 100,000 people, that's your reach, right? You don't rebuke. Guess what? Any one of those people that sins because of you, all of that goes to your account. You might as well just take off your jacket, take off it, just jump into Gehenom head first, like a pool. What's the point of doing any mitzvot? If you're already going to go to Gehenom anyway, for, for keeping quiet. So if you see someone sinning to such an extent, causing people to sin, like a Manus Friedman or a Shmuli Boteach, or any of these other clowns that are distorting the Torah, you have an obligation to warn people. It comes from one of the sources, what I mentioned, another source because you have to love your brothers. You have to love your brothers. You cannot see your brothers continuing to sin because they're listening to false speakers and thinking, no, no, they'll find out eventually. What if they don't? Oh, it's not my problem. According to the Torah, it is your problem. So this is important to know, Rabotai Karim. And for anyone who wants to continue speaking against me, by all means, have fun, have a blast. It doesn't really bother me. I really feel bad for people that do it, simply because, again, I'm not really using my opinion. If you have a lachic sources, if you have a, uh, uh, anything that you could provide in, in black and white, an actual page number, and a book name, an alacha number, or something, bechavud. I have no problem whatsoever retracting everything I've ever done from day one, if you want. If you can prove something that I said is wrong, no problem making a whole shiur about it. This is not a battle of, 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 of egos. This is simply truth versus falsehood. Someone says to you that no matter what, you're not going to get punished, or that Genom is a place where you don't know that you're a soul. All types of shtiot that he says that I don't really want to repeat anymore. Someone says things like this that contradicts Chazal in a million ways. I'm sorry, Rabotai, this is kfira. This is kfira, but it's not regular kfira. If you believe this nonsense yourself, and you're to yourself, that's one thing. You have a problem. But when you're a public speaker and you have a, the, 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 uh, the reach, like he does, of countless people, tens of thousands of people, if not more, this is a, this is a massive epidemic. No less than corona. No less than, than any of the biggest diseases we've ever had. No less than the Black Plague. In fact, it's worse. Because those plagues kill bodies. They don't kill souls. So, for anyone that wants to provide a source of why it's wrong and right and so on and so forth, no problem. But as far as, uh, as, far as what we've done in order to get to this point, like I said, it's been several years in the making. We've spoken to many Talmidei Chachamim. We've tried to get information from this guy. We even spoke to his son, that, uh, not the rapist, but the, the other one that uh, we asked him for sources, instead of providing us sources, he said to us the famous statement that I've told you guys, so what if my father lies a little bit? So what if he lies a little bit? Look at the results. This is a statement that is like in my nightmares. Every day I have a nightmare, I, this is it. This is the nightmare. Someone says that they know they're lying and they're saying, so what? So this abutai, it's you see that this is not, this is a, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You still want to go defend them? You still want to go watch them? Don't say you weren't warned. Don't say you weren't warned. You were warned. You want to go against, you want to go against me? I care less. 
Oh, I'm not going to watch your shirim anymore. Don't watch. I'll, I'll, I'll tell YouTube to stop the royalty payments from your views. Stop it, please. Uh, subscriber number 10,006 says he's not going to watch anymore. So please, YouTube, please, stop the royalties. Torah anytime, stop the royalties. Everybody stop the royalties. So what, don't watch. You do me a favor? You do yourself a favor. I'm teaching Torah. You want to watch? Watch. You don't want to watch? Don't watch. What can I do? I'm going to beg you. Kabutai, it says, emotions get the best of people, unfortunately. Anytime somebody disagrees with their, with their thing, they think, oh, I'm attacking. I'm not attacking. I'm providing you sources. Same thing goes with all the things we've talked about in the last week about this cash advance. Unfortunately, some people are getting the point, but some people are still not getting the point. And this is just the reality of the situation. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more, but for now, let me give you guys the stage. You guys ask some more questions so we can go to a, a different topic. Bechavo, who wants to start? Who says not allowed to go with a talit? Well, they, they, uh, well, they always tell you to take it off, or like when you're in shul, right. you have it on, and usually the people take it off and then go into the, inside the bathroom. Okay, you should take it off, but I'm saying what, what you're saying not allowed. It's two different things. As far as as far as your tzitzit, there's a very common sense uh, uh, answer that your friend perhaps did not consider. Your tzitzit, your talit katan, is part of your clothing. It's not something that you take off and take on. It's part of your clothing. So to take off and take on, that means you would expose your nakedness to the public, which is a bigger sin than, than obviously uh, <laughs> taking even your tefillin into the bathroom. Uh, so you're not allowed to expose your nakedness to people. So it's part of your clothing. There's no problem with it being in the bathroom. Talit, again, also, it shouldn't go into the bathroom because there's no need for it because you're not going to go to the bathroom with the talit on anyway. You're going to take it off in the bathroom. So since you're going to take it off in the bathroom anyway, leave it outside also. There's no point of taking it into the bathroom. It's not part of your clothing. So that's, that's, that's the, uh, the, the basics of it. But if you look at the Gemara, Masechet Brachot, in those days there, was, uh, there wasn't uh, bathrooms like we have today in every building, in every corner, in some places, several bathrooms. In those days, people would have to take their tefillin with them and they would bury the, these tefillin inside the holes of the bathroom so nobody stole them because they didn't want to go on the toilet or the hole that was in the ground and relieve themselves with their tefillin on itself, but they would put it inside the walls right outside of it so no one would steal them, meaning that it still was, you know, the stench was there and so on, but it wasn't perhaps right there and then. Why? Because they were afraid of losing them, meaning that it's a, the, the issue of uh, bringing Kedusha into places of Tinofit, where there's filth and bad smells and so on, uh, is uh, not as uh, significant as the, uh, the issue of actually practicing, meaning praying inside the bathroom or learning inside the bathroom why there's filth and so on. But you should also know that Arab Tzion Abba Shaul gave a fantastic chidush, where he says that in the, uh, the bathrooms that are discussed, in the Gemara and in the Shulchan Aruch are the bathrooms of those times, which in essence were holes in the, in the ground that were filled with filth of everyone that went there over an extended period of time, and then they would clean it up. Now, this meant that that place was always filthy, always smelled terrible, and some parts of the world uh, still have this, unfortunately, but nonetheless, this was it. So that's why you were ne- every time it's mentioned uh, the place of a bathroom, you were never allowed to pray there or say Hashem's name there uh, and so on. But today's bathrooms are different, Rav Tzion says. Why are they different? He says because today's bathrooms, first of all, if you go into your home bathroom, not like a public bathroom that always has constant movement, if you go to your house's bathroom, some people's bathrooms are more expensive than houses. They're quarter million dollar bathrooms. Olam Abba may be worth $5, but their bathroom is at quarter million dollars. But nonetheless, they have a bathroom. It's a beautiful bathroom. But even if it's not beautiful, if it's just a regular nice bathroom, it doesn't have to be a quarter million dollars. Just a regular, I don't know, regular bathroom for one of these houses over here. The bathroom's mechanism is that as soon as you flush the toilet, the feces, the, the fecal matter, all of that stuff that, that was there is gone instantly. It's gone instantly. It's as if it was never there, and uh, after a short period of time, 
there's no smell either. Sometimes even no time because of certain uh, uh, technology they have there and so on. Point being is that that is not the same type of bathroom. So now, if a person, let's say, has, which is what's common in America, that they have a, uh, a bathroom, a toilet, but they also have a bathtub in the same area, in the same room, if you will. It's a big room and it has both of them in it. And let's say they want to sit in the tub. Let's say they want to sit in the tub and they want to just sit there and relax for, I don't know, a half hour or an hour. As long as they're covered, meaning their member is not shown outside of the water or anything like that, or uh, her, uh, and the bathroom itself is clean. There's no fecal matter, there's no nothing, there's no waste whatsoever there. It's completely clean, there's no bad smell whatsoever. You're actually even allowed to listen to Shiyot Torah. Why? It's no longer bathroom. At that moment, there's nothing there. It's just the water that's in the toilet at that moment, you could drink it. I wouldn't necessarily recommend because there's certain germs, but as far as that water is the same type of water as what you drink from the faucet. There's no difference. You're going to find it disgusting, but in reality, it's the same thing. It's the same matter. It comes from the same. What do you think? There's like a special water that goes to your toilet? It's the same water. And, and all the waste that was there is gone. That's it. There's the, 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 the ceramic is not retaining anything. That's why they use ceramic and not other uh, because that ceramic, nothing stays on there. Point being, with outside of germs and so on, there's nothing different about that water. You want to drink it, drink it. You want to do anything like the dime with that water, you have an the dime if you want. As long as there's no waste whatsoever, meaning you have to clean the toilet, there's no smell, you close it, and so on and so forth. Now, this was an extraordinary chidush because we understand that the times do affect the law to a certain extent, do affect the law to a certain extent where the law itself didn't change, but we have to apply the existing law to the same circumstances. So the bathrooms that are mentioned in the Gemara, in the Shulchan Aruch, are not the same bathrooms of today. The bathrooms of today is simply a place takes the where you once you've completed whatever you have to do, that water takes it away. The the smell is gone usually relatively quick, if it, especially if you have uh, uh, all types of uh, technology there, and it's as if it never existed. It's as if it never existed. Now. Should you make all of your uh, learning inside the bathroom? No, obviously. But the point is, is that you understand that it's not the same thing. The point is that you understand it's not the same thing. Don't start learning Gemara inside the bathroom. I mean, it's not that, that's not the point here. Don't distort my words into something that it's not. But the point I'm trying to say is that it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. So the bathroom of today is different. Now, but that's, again, only if it's clean. If it's clean, if there's anything there, then that's different. That's the same thing. So that's also a chidush from Rav Tzion Abba Shaul. Mechavod, next question. Joshua. If someone kills somebody unintentionally uh, and then he gets punished for it, you're saying? Yeah, I guess so. so how is this measure for measure? Okay. So there's a uh, principle in the, in the Torah, it's mentioned in the Gemara, Megalgelin schut al yedeh zakai vechova al yedeh chayav. We, uh, in heaven, the Bet Din of Shemaim brings a merit to someone that has the uh, uh, merit to have that merit and an obligation on someone that has an obligation. Meaning, if someone is doing good things, he's a Shomer Torah and Mitzvot, he's a person that learns Torah, she's a person that is modest, they're doing all types of good things and they do Mitzvot. So the Torah says, Schar Mitzvah, Mitzvah. The, uh, the reward for a mitzvah is another mitzvah. So if a person does a certain type of big mitzvah that Hashem really favors, then Hashem will give him the opportunity to do an even bigger mitzvah. That's why the, uh, one of the Chachamim said at the time of the Shulchan Aruch, I'm not jealous of Rabbi Yosef Karo that he wrote the Shulchan Aruch. I'm jealous at the mitzvah that he did in order to earn 
the merit to write the Shulchan Aruch. So if somebody does a very big mitzvah, Hashem gives them an opportunity as a reward to do an even bigger mitzvah. So, for example, he likes to give money, he gives maser, he gives maser, and he gives uh, 10% every time he gets paid, even though he's struggling, even though it's difficult, even though it's constantly test. So Hashem says, ah, you're passing the test constantly, you're constantly giving maser, guess what, I'm going to give you more money, so your maser becomes even bigger. And if he continues passing the test, Hashem is going to make sure that that maser goes to places that generate even more rewards. Not just give it to your local shul, but perhaps help people do tshuva and so on and so forth. So a person that earns merit by doing the right thing, he earns even bigger merit as a reward. Opposite works the same. If a person is not doing good things, He's doing all types of things that are perhaps borderline sins or sins themselves. Then Hashem is, puts him in a different basket. This guy, anytime there's going to be a, uh, a punishment coming onto the world, anytime there's going to be any type of decree coming onto the world, or perhaps I'm going to use him as the vehicle. Meaning, he is training in the gym instead of going to the Shiu Torah. Why? He wants to be a boxer. He wants to be a uh, UFC or a martial artist. He wants to beat up people. He wants the next, uh, the next uh, Arab guy that says something to him to punch him in the face ten times. That's what he's trained. Instead of going to Shul Torah and understanding that Am Yisrael never won a single war because of their power. Never won a single war because of their power. All of our wars were because of our spirituality. I'm talking about in the Torah, times of Torah. Not a single war was because we were such great uh, warriors. We won because of our Torah. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu, for every uh, thousand soldiers that he sent to go fight the war, he had a thousand people learning Torah. Why? Because you know the merit to learn Torah is, 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 is the reason why we win wars or lose wars. Now, a person that skips learning Torah in order to go train, in order to go uh, shoot guns and so on, Shem says, oh, you think you're the solution? Okay, so you're not only... Mevatel Torah, which is a sin like no other person that wastes time instead of learning Torah, he does other things. But on top of it, you're ignorant, so you're making sins on top of it. And on top of it, you think, oh, So, what I'm going to do, this particular person that deserves to die, because he did something, some random person deserves to die, because he did something bad, Hashem decided this person's time is over, I'm going to use you to kill him on one of your gun training sessions. You know, you're going to shoot, you're going to show off to your friends, you're hitting the bullseye, 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 and you didn't know that this guy was one of the employees and he was standing right behind the bullseye and you were shooting him the whole time. Yeah, but it was an accident. Yes, it was an accident decreed by heaven. It was an accident decreed by heaven. Why? Because of things you did. So that's the midah keneged midah. The measure for measure is that it's not that he made an accidental sin, but he didn't deserve the sin. He deserved the sin, but not for that particular thing, but for something else that he did. If so, if you could do me a favor, press the uh, button behind. Uh, to the the battery apparently is dying quickly. Is it green? You see the green there? It's white. It's white. Okay, so push it to the other side where you see the green. Yeah. Now it's green. I right, suppress so the uh, thing close over there. That's it. That's it. Finished. That's it. Thank you. So the uh, the people that had the uh, accidental sins, they deserved that sin. Meaning, they deserved that uh, that whole thing. That was the measure for measure. It, but it wasn't for that particular act they were doing at that time. So the guy was, let's say, working in a uh, construction, and all of a sudden, you know, he was working, and the hammer fell, and the guy. Somebody was standing right below him. The hammer fell on the head. The guy died. Accidental death. Accidental murder. It's murder, but it's nonetheless, it's an accident. Why did he get this? Because he did something to deserve to kill somebody accidentally. He did, he did something to do it. So Hashem put, that guy deserved to die for something else that he did. And he deserved to kill somebody accidentally. So he doesn't get punished with a death penalty. But he gets punished with getting kicked out of the city. He gets kicked out of the city. That's the, uh, the the punishment for accidental murder is not is not death. It's a uh, it's getting kicked out of the city. So that's that's in essence the uh, the measure for measure. But uh, the biggest thing that a person needs to know is that there are different uh, explanations for everything that we have in a Torah 
But the truth be told is that everything that's in the Torah, the answer to the question, the famous question of why, why does Hashem want us to keep Shabbat? Why did the Holocaust happen? Why does Hashem care if we eat kosher? Why does Hashem only allow us to, uh, you know, be with our wives when she's uh, Torah? Why does, why does Hashem care about any of this stuff? The answer to all of it is because Hashem said so. That's the real answer for everything. But the sages teach us from the Torah itself different ways that uh, we could make it soft on our ear to understand it. Different ways that rationalize it in accordance with the rules of the Torah. Not like they're not making it up out of uh, thin air. They're telling us this is one of the many possibilities of why Hashem did this. But it could be also an unknown reason. And that's what Shlomo Melech learned from the Paraduma. The Paraduma was a unique mitzvah that uh, Shlomo Melech, when he got to it, he understood, he thought he understood the entire Torah. But then he got to Paraduma and he says, This one is Rechokamimeni, this one is far from me. And he said, What? Just this mitzvah is the only one you don't understand? He goes, No, I learned from the Paraduma that the entire Torah is far from me. Like everything I thought I knew, I don't know anything. Now, he knows a lot more than anybody else in the world combined, but the point being is that he understood how great the Torah is that even all of the explanations that we have for every single mitzvah that we have, for every single act that we have, doesn't necessarily need to be the only one. There is something else because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is infinite. And he even told Moshe Rabbeinu, we learn in Gemara Masechet Brachot, I'll do whatever I want. Meaning, you don't necessarily need to understand everything. But we have explanations for certain things. We have explanations for certain things. One of the uh, um, stories that rings a bell right now that explains this in a uh, different way is that Rav Yagin, Allah Shalom, when he was younger, he uh, had a question. Where was God during the Holocaust? You know, there's a lot of people died. Six million people died. Not all, all of them... Not all of them were uh, Rashaim. Many of them were Tzadikim. Not all of them were uh, liberal, lefty, atheists, and, uh, and uh, you know, converted to different religions. Many, some people were Tzadikim. Rav Wasserman, Allah wa Shalom, was a huge Tzadik, and many, many other Tzadikim other than him. So how come they died? First and foremost, the basic answer is that when there's a decree on the entire nation, the Malach HaMavid gets permission to kill the Tzadikim and the Rashaim. Because everyone is at fault for, to a certain extent. But still, nonetheless, he wanted to go deeper. So he went to a, uh, a very well-known professor that was friends with um, Einstein, but was a religious Jew, not like Einstein. Uh, and uh, I forget his name, but uh, this famous professor was his next-door neighbor. So he said to him, this question, where was God during the Holocaust? So he said, come over to my house on Shabbat, we'll learn together. So he comes to his house, and uh, Rabbi again at that time was a young guy, you know, maybe 20 years old, 18 years old. And uh, they're standing and he's asking them a question. And as he's asking them the question, there was a little mosquito flies between them. And the professor, which was a serious Talmud Chacham, knew how to use the world in order to learn from it. So he tells Rabbi again, you see that mosquito? He said, yeah. He says, do you think that mosquito understands our conversation? He says, no. He says, why not? He doesn't speak Hebrew. You think, well, maybe he's an Arabic uh, Muslim uh, mosquito? He goes, no, he's just he's a mosquito. He goes, so what if he's a mosquito? How come he doesn't understand what we're talking about? He goes, because he's a mosquito. I mean, the distance between us, our intellect and the mosquito is far. He goes, ah. Distance between us and the mosquito is far, therefore he doesn't understand us, right? The distance between us and a Kadosh Baruch Hu is much, much greater than the distance between us and the mosquito. Therefore, we don't have to understand everything that he does. You understand? You don't have to have an explanation for everything. There are explanations for almost everything. But even if you sometimes have a different explanation for the same thing that's based on Torah... Doesn't both of them are words of the living God? Even if the two explanations are not necessarily the same, that's another aspect of the 70 faces of the Torah. But again, it has to be based on Torah laws, Torah principles, not just your idea. 
there are certain laws that every idea, every chidush has to be founded on. It cannot just be something that you just came up with out of thin air. Like people come up with nonsense. For example, uh, you know, they, uh, people love to play with gimatria. You know, the numerical value of single words and so on, uh, you know, you calculation. Because the gimatria, the, the Mishnah says, gimatria is parperot lechokma. These are like uh, different parperot. Um, I guess it's like different, like, uh, uh, what are those things that you put, flavorings and so on, on, on food. So the gimatria will give you like certain secrets and, uh, you know, you could delve into it to find different secrets within the Torah. But it's not the Torah itself, per se, that you don't learn a lacha from gimatria, from figuring out the, uh, the, the numerical value of a word. You don't learn, you know, uh, the, the basic foundation of Torah from, uh, from the gimatria. But it's different hints. You get different hints of which direction this is heading, which direction that's heading. Like, for example, the word elokim, which means a, uh, a God, but the, uh, the measure of judgment of God, has the same uh, numerical value, the same gimatria, is hateva, which means uh, uh, nature, the nature. So Hashem passes His judgment on the world, punishment per se, uh, through nature, hurricanes, earthquakes, corona, all types of things like that. That's how Hashem passes His judgment on the world. So, or one of the ways per se. So now, you're not going to learn, you know, Allah Shabbat from Gimatia, though. You're not going to learn uh, the, uh, even the date of Mashiach from Gimatia, but that's the foolishness of people. So what do they do? They said, oh, look, Donald Trump, Gimatria Mashiach. And some fools even have a whole website about this. They say, oh, see, Donald Trump is the Mashiach. Ignoring the Allah that the Mashiach has to be a Jew. Ignoring the Allah that the Mashiach cannot even be a convert. Why? Because he has to be a descendant of David the Melech. You cannot be a convert and a descendant of David the Melech. So, uh, ignoring everything else. No, be- why? Because the gematria of Donald Trump and Mashiach is the same thing. Therefore, Donald Trump is Mashiach. Because he's good to Jews, like people think. He's good until he's not going to be good. But the point is, Rabotai, uh, people need to understand, there are Torah laws of how to verify and validate a chidush, an insight, and, and let's see whether it's legit, whether it has any any legs to stand on. It cannot just be anything. But uh, again, even if something uh, that you have is a uh, um, unique, and no one has said it before, as long as it's still within the body of laws of the Torah, no problem. Chazaku Baruch, that's your chidush. And as Zohar Kadosh says, that every Jew has his own chidushim to bring to the world. Every Jew has his own chidushim to bring to the world that no one's going to bring them other than him. And if he doesn't bring them, they're going to have a case against them in Shemaim. Look, there's a certain part of the Torah that you are supposed to uncover into the world. Like, you know, every time you take another layer of the onion, you are supposed to take that layer with your new insights of the... And you didn't bring them. Why? Because you didn't study. Instead, you went to basketball games. You went to bar mitzvahs. You went to do a bunch of different things that you weren't obligated to do, and you forsook your obligation. And because of you, there's less Torah in the world. And that's what also a person needs to know. The uh, Chachamim explained uh, that a person, when he goes up to Shemaim, he'll have to give a shiur Torah for 180 days. Straight, no breaks, no jokes either. Manus Friedman joke's not going to work up there. 180 days straight. That means you have to know a lot of Torah during your life. During your life. Next question. Sutton, you had a question, no? Yeah. I answered it already? No. Oh. Let's say I see my neighbor driving on Shabbos. Okay. Do I have to, like, I have to tell them directly? If you see your neighbor driving on Shabbat, uh, do you have to tell them directly? Is that the question? So your neighbor doesn't like you, but you see him driving on Shabbat. Right. Okay. So that's why the... Very good question. Very good question. So the mitzvah of rebuke is, starts with, 
says you must rebuke your brother, but don't get to a way of sin. Meaning, your rebuke should not lead the person to sin. So one of the ways that uh, Chachamim explain it is that sometimes there are certain people that they refuse to listen to you. Even if what you're saying is true. You're not the vessel. Usually this happens between spouses and siblings. It's very hard for an older brother to listen to rebuke from his younger brother. No matter how smart the younger brother is, it's very, very difficult. The older brother has to be like a mini Moshe Rabbeinu in order to listen to rebuke of his younger brother. Even if his younger brother is a rabbi and he's smart, and he's a good guy, and he means well and so on, he's still the younger brother. Same thing with parents. Parents will have a very, very, almost impossible time to listen to rebuke from their children. Why? Because no matter how smart you are and how well intended you are and how wonderful you are, they will always look at you as this little boy or little girl that they used to change diapers for. Doesn't matter, even if you're 50 years old, you're still that same little kid they change diapers for. So now you're telling me what to do? No, come on. Very hard for parents to listen to rebuke from kids. Very hard, almost impossible. Same thing with spouses with each other. Wives like to rebuke their husbands, telling them what to do. This is not exactly the ideal situation. It's not exactly the ideal situation, but obviously somebody has to tell them what to do. So a wife has to be smart of when to do it, how to do it. First off, I remember hearing Ravi again one time say, if you see a husband do something wrong, don't tell him right away. Wait a few days. Wait a few days. Why? If he's doing something wrong right now, maybe he's hot, maybe he's, uh, his mind is on it, and uh, he maybe he already knows. Wait a few days before you give him the rebuke. Don't be like one of these people you attack right away because he's not going to take it well. Already he's not going to take it well because you're his wife. Already she's not going to take it well because you're her husband. But nonetheless, you should uh, be very clever with the way they rebuke and who you rebuke. Now, so sometimes a person needs to know that it's not necessarily the message but rather the messenger that is the reason why the person is not getting the rebuke. So if you already know that this person is a person that doesn't like you, do not rebuke them directly. Why? It's a foolish move because by default, they're not only not going to listen to you, they may end up making the sin even worse just to, to spite you, which will lead them to sin. So there's no point of you rebuking them because they're now, even if they know you're right, now just because you said it, they'll do something worse. So that's not smart. You want to help them after all. You don't want to prove them wrong. You just want to help them. That's what the whole intention of of, a rebuke is, to help people. So what are you supposed to do? you got to rebuke them indirectly. Whether it's your spouse or your neighbor or whoever it is, rebuke them indirectly by sending them a video. If they truly don't like you, uh, then uh, send them the video anonymously. Anonymous email, anonymous uh, text message, anonymous letter, that they don't know it's coming from you. And have that video that's me talking or Rav Mizrahi talking or anyone that's talking about this specific issue that actually telling the truth about this issue. Uh, have them tell them the, uh, in the video or the book or whatever it is that's going to deliver the message to this person because once they hear it from me, I don't know them. So they know I'm not, I'm not talking about them per se, but it is about them. So they're not going to feel attacked by me. Because I don't know them. I'm, I'm, the video is talking to a bunch of other people. But the message is related to them. And if they're clever, they'll take it to heart. Hopefully they're clever enough to take it to heart after uh, only one video. But sometimes it takes a year worth of videos, two years worth of videos. Point being, Abutai, is that sometimes people um, do themselves a, uh, a great service by not doing things directly, by being smart enough to know that they're not the messenger. They're not the messenger to rebuke people, but they want to help the public. They want to help other people. So what do they do? Instead of uh, doing it themselves, like I said, they have me do it by sending one of our video clips, by uh, giving them one of our CDs, sending, us one, sending them one of their shulim, adding them to the group, bringing them to a shul, and so on and so forth. So that way that person will get the message, but not necessarily from the vessel that they're refusing. Uh, and that way you will help them as well as help yourself because you're fulfilling a huge mitzvah of rebuke, but not necessarily by doing it directly. But it's no less of a mitzvah. It's, it's actually a bigger mitzvah. Uh, There's a uh, principle in the Torah that someone 
who enables another person to do a mitzvah gets a bigger merit, a bigger reward than the person who actually does it himself. So you, let's say, for example, you donate $100 to Bezat Hashem, I'm going to do all the work, right? But the fact that you donated the hundred, $100, I'm going to go rebuke the person or tell the person to do this and this and that. They end up keeping mitzvot because I was able to pay the rent or I was able to pay the employees. I was able to, uh, you know, buy some batteries, whatever I was able to do with that money or CDs. Now, I was able to do because of that $100 that you gave, right? Even though I'm the one that made them technically do tshuva, you get a bigger merit than me. Why? It was done with your money. It was done with your money. So that's why people that contribute money to Kiruv, real Kiruv, uh, resources and things of that nature, there is a, uh, no, more, no one more fortunate than them because they enable the mitzvah to happen. They enable the mitzvah to happen. So don't think that the rebuke always has to be done directly. But sometimes, this is a side note quickly, sometimes you are the messenger. Sometimes... There, no one else in the world will be the messenger. Like, for example, the event we had last night in Five Towns, the, uh, the guy that hosted the event, he told me himself, when Sonny and I arrived, we were talking for a little while, and uh, he told me, listen, I've been listening to rabbis for years, listening to many different rabbis for many, many years, but nothing changed. Nothing changed. I started listening to you, but I, I fell, in the beginning, I fell asleep for five minutes. But that five minutes shook me up. So I tried it again, another five minutes, fell asleep, another five minutes. But every time I would listen to you, it would shake me up and I would start changing. And then I realized, guys, very smart guys, is I realized you're the messenger. Other rabbis are nice, they're smart guys, they're all wonderful people. But you are the messenger. I said, some people, I'm the messenger. Some, sometimes I'm not the messenger, but oh, Hashem, I was in this case. So that's the key. A person needs to know that sometimes you are the messenger. You're the only one. There's no one else. One woman uh, sent me a, uh, an email today. Uh, she said, uh, 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 thank you for helping me do tshuva for modesty. She says, I get embarrassed when you talk so bluntly about the immodest woman because I know you're talking directly to me. And she says, that's the only thing that helped me change. Because I knew you're talking to me. Even though I don't know her, I've never seen her in my life. But the words that I say, she heard other things from other places, from other rabbis, other books, and so on. But the message that came out of my, my mouth, HaKadosh decided that's the code. Just like you have a, a safe. Okay, your neshama has a safe. And a certain code that's going to work. You could put a bunch of different numbers, it's not going to work. You could play with the numbers, have a good time with the numbers. Play tic-tac-toe if you want. But it's not going to work. It's not going to open the safe. But then there's the code. There's certain words that's going to come from a certain messenger. That's a specific code for that neshama. Nothing else is going to work. Just that one. So sometimes you're the messenger. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes it's you. Sometimes others. But you need to be honest enough with yourself to know when you are and when you're not the messenger. Don't let your ego get in the way and force yourself on things. That's why, for example, when people ask me to talk to certain people about helping them do tshuva, I say before I talk to anyone, have them watch my movie. Why? Because that movie, aside from teaching a lot of different things that impact everybody's life, whether you're rich, you're poor, you're on Wall Street, you're not on Wall Street, you're in business, you're not in business, you're intermarried, you're not intermarried, you're a kid that's intermarried, you're a friend that's intermarried, you're sick, you're healthy, you're afraid of being sick, all types of issues, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch gave me a nice, fantastic roller coaster to go through for the merit of Am Yisrael. And also for my sins, unfortunately. But nonetheless, that whole movie is also going to give the person clarity of whether I'm the messenger. Because at the end of that movie, you're either going to love me and want to listen to more things that I say, or you're just going to say, not for me. Not for me. Baruch Hashem, the overwhelming majority of people have said the, 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 they loved it and they uh, continue to watch. But... Uh, I'm not uh, in, uh, delirious. I know there's certain people that probably won't like it. Uh, point being is that you have to be honest with yourself. You can't force yourself everywhere and just say, oh, no, no, I'm the messenger. I'm the only one. But for some people, you are the only one. For some people, you are the only one. Next question. Ken.
I'm telling them the general idea of, uh, behind what they're doing. Now. And at that point, they feel like they fulfilled their application. So if the person continue doing the sin, is that on them or they have an application to continue doing it? And Or if they feel like one time you get lost and that's it and they fulfill their application. Is this a regular member or is this a, this is a rabbi? Um, or is it like a leader of the community of some kind? No, so that's it's a, if it's a regular member of the kila, if it's like a friend, you told a certain friend of yours to uh, to start keeping Shabbat, and he's not listening to you. That is a lesser uh, lesser issue than the rabbi, because the rabbi has a constant obligation to rebuke people. Uh, I mean, everyone has a constant obligation to rebuke, but even more so for a rabbi, because that's his role. That's really his job. The job of a rabbi is not to tell everybody they're all tzaddikim. You're all great. You're all wonderful. The job of a rabbi is to, in essence, help people get to the Torah, raise their, themselves to the Torah by teaching them about the things that they're doing wrong, helping guide them to go on the right path, and also teaching them sort of how to do things right. That's the job of a rabbi. It's not to uh, be a money collector. It's not to be the chazan in a, uh, in a, in a uh, bit knesset. It's none of that stuff. You can do all that other stuff, but that's not the primary reason you have a rabbi. The primary reason for a rabbi is to get the whole keilah to the Torah. So, he has a constant obligation to rebuke, uh, so much so that the Rambam writes, and I believe it's in Ilchot Shuva, that uh, you have to rebuke a person until he beats you up. I mean, he has to constantly tell him over and over again, obviously in his own way, in a nice way, in a... Uh, uh, depending on the sin, sometimes not such a nice way, in a uh, raised voice, in a low voice, and whatever he knows using his wisdom of how to do it, and how frequently to do it, and how, uh, um, what time to do it, and so on. But nonetheless, he has the constant responsibility to rebuke people uh, until they beat him up. Some say it's until they threaten to beat him up. But nonetheless, it's definitely not one time. Definitely not one time. It's pretty much... Until you get to a uh, point, like it's a, uh, so much so, the Rambam writes that if someone is speaking in shul, someone is speaking in shul while everyone is praying, you have to rebuke them privately first. If they continue speaking in shul, you have to embarrass them publicly. Even though to embarrass a Jew publicly is a person can lose their olam haba. Amal bim pnei chavero berabim, en lo chelek lo olam the Gemara says. Someone that uh, embarrasses another Jew in public loses his share, wo- share of the world to come. Even if they kept Shabbat, even if they kept this and they kept that, you embarrass another Jew in public, you could lose a lot of But the Rambam says, yes, but that's only someone that is not desecrating Hashem's name. That's not this person that is speaking in shul. He's desecrating Hashem's name. You are obligated. You, you go embarrass him in public. Why? Because he's talking in shul and the whole Kela is suffering that their prayers are not being answered while he's talking. So that's why the Shulchan Aruch says, this Avera that he's doing in talking in Shul during prayer is uh, too big. He doesn't even say how big, he just says it's too big. It's the only thing in the entire Shulchan Aruch. He says this sin is too big. Why? Because everybody's tefillah in the Bet Knesset doesn't get answered because of him. So the Rambam says, you, you asked him nicely. Once, twice, you ask him nicely to, 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 to stop it, he continues, embarrass him in public. And he actually even says, I, I believe I read it somewhere else, either Rambam or somewhere else says that in the older days, he said that you're supposed to have a, um, like a uh, police in the Bekness and escort these people out, kick them out. Escort these people out. So, point is, is that obviously this stuff doesn't really exist today, uh, at least not, not in the places that I know of in America. But uh, it's, it's, rebuke is very much an important part of not only Judaism, but of human life. Without rebuke, without telling people that they're going in the wrong direction, that means we cannot teach anything. If everyone's always right, then what's the point of teachers? You know, your kid tells you, uh, you ask your kid, I, I know, well, how much is uh, 1 plus 1? The kid says 11. Now, if you don't correct that kid, the kid's going to end up becoming uh, retarded. He's, he's, gonna be, he's not going to graduate first grade. Why? Because it's not 11. It's 2. In case you're wondering, it's 2. So it's 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. You have to correct the kid. Oh, but then he'll cry that he was wrong. Okay, let him cry. 
What do you mean? It's, it's better that he cry for a minute than, I, than they cry for, for much longer. You have to tell him the truth. Now, of course, everybody does things in their own way, lightly, politely, not lightly, not politely. You have to know how to do and what to do. But the point is that correcting people, i.e. rebuke, is very much a necessary part of human life. That's what everyone in the world uses with no problem in every part of their life. If you work for a sales team, if you're a salesman, for example, usually you have sales meetings, okay? If you're a teacher, you have teacher meetings. If you're a part of a uh, kitchen, you're a chef, a part of a team of chefs, you are you have uh, the, the, the meeting of all the chefs, right? Now, if you're all types of employees, you have team meetings. What happens in those team meetings? What happens in those corporate meetings? The leader comes and tells everybody, hey, guys, I've had it with you. You got you to gotta step it up. Sales are down. The food stinks. This is that. We're losing customers. You got to do something to get people up there. Everybody has their own way. Some people do this. Some people do that. But the point being is that the whole purpose of the meeting is to get everybody to step up and fix their ways. And no one has a problem with it. Why? Because they know they need to do it. When do they have a problem with it? When it comes to Torah. When it comes to Torah. The only time it actually matters. The only times it actually matters, you tell the guy, listen, you have to do this, this, and that. You have to be modest. You have to keep kosher. You have to learn to, ah, no, no, come on, stop judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you things you need to do to, to save your olam But that's the thing. The Yetzirah doesn't interfere with your corporate meeting, but he interferes with your rabbi meeting. He interferes with your Torah meeting. That's a person needs to be honest with themselves and realize if someone came to you and rebuked you, that's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself sent them. Kadosh Baruch Hu himself sent this person to rebuke you, and that's why Shlomo HaMelech says, don't hate rebuke. Those that hate rebuke, die. That's what he says. Those that hate rebuke, dies. Why? Because someone that hates rebuke is not going to listen to any correction. He's going to continue living his life a mistake day after another. And he says he's going to be a sinner, and uh, sinners, the Shaim, are considered uh, dead in, while they're alive. Because there's no chance this person is going to go to heaven if he doesn't fix his sin. And if he doesn't want to listen to rebuke, then how is he going to fix it? So it's very, very much necessary to do it. Yes, Chavot, question. My synagogue, uh, it's not one person that speaks when it's prayers. It's, no, it's only prayers. It's actually when they read the, the Megillah. The, the Torah? The Torah, the Megillah, the stilts it's going to happen. They always speak. People are always constantly speaking. It doesn't matter what you say to them. They, they have a, they have a rabbis in the in I can't say anything. I get up, I'll try to say something. Does the rabbi talk also? He says that, he tells everybody to stop. People will shush, read it, but just keep talking. You don't care. Okay. And I see and I hear it, and I just move, you know, I move from chair to chair. Right, so what's the question? So what, what, what do I do? Do I get up and move? Because I keep doing that, but I feel like I'm still talking. Okay, so the question is, there's a Bikneset with a keila full of amaratzot, ignorant people that speak during shul, during the prayer, during the... Uh, reading of the Torah during Megillat Esther, which, by the way, if you hear, if you miss one word from the Megillah, you did not fulfill your mitzvah, just so you know. If, there, if the Baal Kore is reading from the Megillah and people are talking, for sure you're going to miss words. That means you have to start from the beginning. So if you have a shul that people are talking and you know they're going to talk during Megillat Esther, don't go there because you're not going to fulfill the mitzvah. You might as well stay home or go to a different shul. But anyway, if you have a shul full of ignorant people rude people uh, that care less about anybody other than themselves and they're talking during prayer no matter what the rabbi says meaning even if the rabbi says to them shush they don't what is the answer what do you do there's only one solution change bet knesset you cannot go to such a big knesset the same answer my rabbi told me i told him listen there's a there's a big knesset it's wonderful, it's big, it's beautiful, lots and lots of people, and it's right next to my house, so it's really, really convenient. It's only one problem. The mechitza, the mechitza between the men and the women is like see-through, it's like holes in it. It's like almost as if it's not there. So what do I do? Can I just uh, look, not look? He says, you're not allowed to step into such a bit knesset. Not allowed to pray there. Why? Not allowed. 
Go find a new one. I said, yeah, but the next one is two miles later. He says, no, so exercise. Oh, there's no other Beknesset. Who says you have to go to Beknesset then? You should go to Beknesset, but well, you know, you're not gonna, you can't fulfill a mitzvah by way of Avera. A place where there's clowns like this that speak during Shul no matter what, they have no kavod for the Torah, you're not allowed to go to such a bit Knesset. Not allowed. You step away, you leave, and you go to a different place. But, I mean, most places are not like that. Most places have people talking during Shul, but if you shush them, or the rabbi at least shushes them, usually people are polite enough to, uh, to, to, to quiet down. If they're not even that, then these people are simply people you have to run away from. Run away from them like they have the coronavirus. Serious, I'm not joking. Run away from them like they have the coronavirus because these people are infectious, rotten people. They're rotten nishamot. It's not, not, it's not an exaggeration. Somebody that speaks during shul simply is somebody that has a desire, selfish desire. But someone that disrespects the rabbi after the rabbi tells him to be quiet and he still can, you know, continues to do it week after week, day after day, no matter what, that's a rotten neshama. That's no, no doubt in my mind. That person's a of love. So, now you're not, since we don't know that for sure, you're not allowed to kill him, but definitely don't be next to him. Why? Because if a bomb falls, most likely, if you're next to him, you, you may not be spared. I'm serious. And it's, uh, you know, it's, I'm making fun of it a little bit, but I'm being serious also. Don't be next to such people. People that have bad manners are, are bad people. They just don't be next to them. It's so much so that sometimes you'll see somebody that knows Torah but has bad manners. So the Gemara says, what's, uh, what's better? If I have a Talmud uh, Chacham, someone knows a lot of Torah, but has bad midot, has bad manners. You know, he uh, does all types of things that are bad manners. I don't have to explain to you guys what bad manners are. But then I have another guy, doesn't know anything. Doesn't know anything about Torah, but he has good manners. He's a good man, he's a generous guy. Torah says, run away from this tal- rotten Talmud Chacham and befriend the person that's ignorant but has good manners. Why? Because if the guy has good manners, we can teach him Torah. And he'll be not only Talmud Chacham, but also have good manners. But if the guy already learned Torah and he still has bad manners, this person is worse than a dead animal in the street. He doesn't even know how to use the Torah. He learned the Torah, but uh, he didn't learn anything from the Torah. He read the Torah, but didn't get anything from it. So this guy used the medicine, but he doesn't, it's not curing him. He's dead. Bad manners is, is, is something that Torah hates. Hates, hates with a, with a uh, passion. Uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu despises people like that. So much so that Gaumi Vina. The Gaon Mivina says someone that does not fix his manners, does not fix his character traits in his life, says there's no purpose to his life. says, what did you live for? Now you're going to say, oh, what about if, uh, you know, I have relatives that have bad manners? You can't pick your relatives, right? But it doesn't mean you have to be next to them. Can't pick your parents, can't pick your brothers and sisters, can't pick uh, these people. Doesn't mean you have to spend time with them. Yeah, but then they'll get hurt. Let them get hurt. Better they get hurt than you get hurt. Like this young woman came to the uh, shul on uh, in, uh, last night. She's been watching my shul in Baruch Hashem for several years. She's a uh, black convert. And uh, I was telling her that uh, it's time for her to find a shiduch, get married with Hashem. And she says, oh, but I'm concerned about, you know, racism. If I marry uh, another black guy, then uh, maybe they're going to say something. But if I marry a white guy, then they're going to say something else. I said, first off, I spoke about this topic last week. For anyone who doesn't, didn't, hasn't watched, I spoke about it extensively last week about this whole racism issue in regards to uh, uh, Judaism, a little bit more updates than what I said initially a few months ago. But I said some more stuff last week. But even more so, I had a chidush while I was talking to her. Some people, some people are colorblind. Some people are colorblind. It's a moon. It's a de- de- defect. Person doesn't see color. Doesn't see color. He looks at everything. Everything is black and white. He's still in the uh, 40s. 1940. Everything, everything is black and white. But some people, only all they see is color. Meaning, 
they don't care what you say, but if you're black or you're, or you're white or you're burgundy or you're Chinese or you're whatever, that's all they care about, the fact that you're different than them. So I said, listen, let's be honest with each other. If you saw some paraplegic fall off the, off the chair, you're going to make fun of him? No, no, no. Why? It's wrong. It's wrong to make fun of somebody that's a balmum. It's wrong to make fun of somebody that uh, has a defect, right? So if you told the colorblind guy, no, no, what color is that? You see that pink over there? He says, no, you're not going to make fun of him that he doesn't see colors, right? It's not nice to make fun of somebody that uh, has a defect, right? So the guy that only sees color, he's also a balmum. He's also defective. Why are you taking anything he says into account? He's defective in his head. He's racist. He's a defect. Don't care what he says. This guy is a paraplegic in his head. All he sees is black and white and green and burgundy. He doesn't care about the opinions. And that's a, that's a personal defect. Why would you ever put any value to his opinion? Defective mind. Don't deserve any, any, any value. No, that's it. So, oh, Hashem, this, this hit the... Uh, um, was, was, was what she needed to hear. Ms. Hashem, she'll, she'll move on in a positive way in our life. Uh, but that's for everybody. That's really for everybody that... There's always going to be people that are haters. There's always going to be people that are going to judge you for the wrong reason. Don't pay them any attention. If you know that a Kadosh Baruch Hu agrees with what you're doing, that's all that matters. Yeah, but it hurts me. Why does it hurt you? Why does it hurt you because they look at you because you're black, because they look at you because you're Sfaradi, or they look at you because you're Yemenite? Why does it hurt you? Why? Is it hurt you because they're right? Or does it hurt you because you don't understand that they are defective? They're defective. I mean, you don't, you're, you're upset because someone defective made fun of you. Like, I mean, it's, uh, who's really wrong here? You are them. You're, you're upset that someone defective made fun of you. Like, I mean, uh, come on. They're a defective person. If there was a special class for people, they, they would be it. They would be the class president. What's the why 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 are you why are you upset that they're they're racist they're defective people they're bale mum. Don't take what they say to, to account. Who cares what they say? Let them go smash their head against the wall. In Judaism, color does not matter. What matters is how you live your life and what kind of Torah you live. Your opinion is valid or not valid. It's valid if it's from the Torah. It's not valid if it's not from the Torah. That's what Judaism Judaism talks about. You look at all of the books in the Torah, you'll see it says all types of sources. It mentions Rashi, it mentions the Rambam, the Ramban, uh, the Baal Shem Tov, all types of sages. And guess what? There's no pictures next to any of the sages. Why? We don't care what they look like. We care what they say. We care what they say because we know what they say is from Mount Sinai. So it doesn't matter what they look like. One of the fantastic stories that I heard in my life is one of the people that was in the uh, Bet Midrash of uh, Arab El Yashiv, Allah Shalom, one time found a piece of paper with a fantastic handwritten chidush, a new insight, Torah insight written on it, but no name. Now, they knew this Bet Midrash is where Rabbi Yashiv is uh, he's the Gdol Adol, not just of that Bet Midrash, but of the world. But they knew that he writes a lot of things. So they came to the Rav, said, For the Rav, this Chidush, is it yours? It doesn't have a name on it. So Rabbi Yashiv, in his humility, in his beautiful Emet, he says, Is it good? If it's good, then who cares where it's from? If it's bad, then also who cares what's from? Throw it in the garbage. If it's good, use it. Don't have to. What, what, what does it matter who it's from? If it's good, use it. Baruch Hashem. But if it's not good, it's in the garbage. Even if it is for me. Even if it is for me, but if it's not good, it's in the garbage. It's not it's thrown in the garbage. That's what every person needs to understand. In Judaism, we don't care about your color. We don't care about your uh, height and weight and your gender and so on. All we care about is whether you're living the truth or not. Now, if you're going to care about it, then that means you're the one that's racist. If you want everyone to give you special attention because you're Sephardi or you're Ashkenazi or you're Hasidish or you're black or you're white or you're Chinese or you're from, I don't know, some other place, 
you're an alien, you have three heads, whatever, you want special attention, then you, my friend, are the racist. Not everybody else. You, my friend, are the racist. But that's, that's the reality. Anyone that makes fun of you, they're a Baal Mum. Baal Mum. Baal Mum. Baal Mum cannot be a Kohen. Baal Mum cannot work in a Bet Mikdash. You know, if, if, if it says there's a special parasha, it talks about the Kohanim. If the Kohen has unibrow, it's considered deformity. Not allowed to work in a Bet Mikdash. What do you think is the worst Mum? Being racist or having a unibrow? Unibrow you can fix. Take a little pinceta, you fix the unibrow. Racism is very hard to fix. Why? It becomes part of the person's nature. You understand? So don't take offense from people that are Baalei Mum. You just feel bad for them. You know, hopefully one day, Kadosh Baruch puts them in a special institution to fix themselves. And maybe you guys could donate for that cause. That's it. Miskenim. Miskenim. I must be Miskenim. That's all it is. I have a guy... Sends me, now it's got, wait, it was, he was sending me 40, 45 emails a day. Then he stopped for a little while. Now he's back, Baruch Hashem. Uh, he sends me about 15 to 20 emails a day telling me about how much he doesn't like me and how racist he is and how he hates Jews and how he hates me and this and that. It's a bad move. Delete, 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 delete. Delete. That's it. That's just, 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 just Baruch Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu created a delete button. That's it. Delete. Delete. Move on with your life. Don't even read it. Don't even pay attention to it. Move on. Move on. Move on. It's like bad smell. Go away from it. It goes away. That's it. Bal mum. Just think about it next time. Somebody this says something to you. Oh, poor guy. What do you mean, poor guy? He just made fun of you. He called you a name. Me skin. Me skin. <laughs> Give the guy a hug. Goes, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You know what? Let me write something. Let me give you a check for the next foundation for the Bale Moom of race. Well, let's... Give the guy Staka, baby. Hey, hey, hey. Come here. Let me skin. Say, well, you see somebody missing a leg, missing an arm. You're probably going to give him some Staka if the guy needs, right? Guy's racist. Give him some Staka. Hey, hey. Yeah, I love you. I love you. God, it's like, don't worry. It's going to be okay. Hey, hey. Kapara. Hey, hey. Give him some stalker. The guy is a bad move. He's getting racist. <laughs> you have to understand, he's already ruined his own life and his olam haba. How are you going to be upset about it? He's already ruined his own life. He's already ruined his own life living with so much hatred in himself. What kind of life is that? Give him some stalker. Give him some skin. Maybe he'll enjoy something in this world at least. Get some candy. Skin. Poor guy. Yeah, give him a lollipop. Yeah, I'm a little. Give him a lollipop. Give him a hug. Give him a hug. No, no, oh, don't touch me. Oh, let me skin. Give him more hug. You want to give him? Give him another stack. Okay, no, here, here. Here's twenty dollars. You know, I was gonna give you five, but I see you're really a serious smoom here. Here's twenty. Here's twenty. Here. Here's twenty. Pay attention to these people. Skin him. Poor people. No, yeah, almost, almost. Last question. No, anything? Chabad. Alvai. Everything you don't Amen. Seed. Nah. Amen. And you don't believe in the coming of Mashiach. You don't believe in the coming of Mashiach? Yeah. Huh? What do you mean you don't believe in the coming of the Mashiach? You, 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 you're, not, you're not every day believing that the Mashiach is going to come. You but do you believe that Mashiach will come? You be- I'm, saying I'm not saying you, I'm saying the person believes the Mashiach will come. Forget about all the mitzvot. I'm talking. Okay. Does, the be- does the person believe, okay, so you're asking. He does the person. Hold on, one second, one second, one, two, one, second, one step at a time. So a person is keeping all of the mitzvot. I'm in. And, uh, but he doesn't believe the Mashiach is going to come, or he believes the Mashiach is going to come. But not anytime soon. What, which, what, which one is it? So I understand the question. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't believe in the Mashiach. Like he doesn't think the Mash- there is a Mashiach, he just I thinks that this out. world is the world? Yeah, it, was, it was just a story made up. It was just a story to, to, to push people to, to, to be, continue oh, to be. Oh, okay, okay. So this, uh, all right, so a person that does not believe in the coming of the Mashiach, he's violating the 13 principles of faith, and he's considered 100% a kufir gamu. 
He's considered a heretic. He has no share of the world to come. He could uh, keep uh, keep uh, whatever he wants. Keep a nice uh, collection of kipot. Doesn't make a difference. Uh, so there's a uh, person that is a doesn't believe in the thirteen principles of faith. These are foundational beliefs of Judaism. Now, to say that he keeps all of the mitzvot is impossible, and the reason why is because each mitzvah connects to another. Each mitzvah connects to another, which means that if a person violates one of the principles, surely the other mitzvot have some type of mum in them, some type of deformity in them. Meaning that the Rambam writes that a goy that keeps the seven Noahide laws, if he keeps them because God said so, then he's considered one of Chazdeu Mot Olam. He's considered one of the righteous among the nations, and he has a share of the world to come. But if he keeps the seven Noahide laws only because it makes sense to him not to murder, it makes sense to him not to eat the bat while it's still alive. It makes sense to him to have a court system. It makes sense to him not to commit adultery. It makes sense to him, not because God said so. The Rambam says not only is he considered a fool, but he also has no share of the world to come, even if he fulfilled all of those mitzvot. You have to fulfill all of the mitzvot because God said so, not because they make sense to you. So a person that violates one of the person, uh, one of the principles uh, of uh, 13 principles of faith is a person that's not keeping the laws because God said so, but rather because they make sense to him. And if that's the reason, then none of his mitzvot have any merit whatsoever. It's like a person that washes his hands. He's not going to get a merit for washing his hands. If he does netilat yadayim with the thing, and then he says a blessing, then he's going to get a merit, he's going to mitzvah for it. But if he just washes his hands, there's no mitzvah for that. So the point is, is that a person that starts manipulating the law to law to his own likings, he has a very, very serious problem, especially when it comes to the principles of faith. If he violated other things, he could still have a share of the world to come. But if uh, violating one of the 13 principles of faith, that's a very, very serious infraction, unfortunately. Makes the person a heretic. Next question. That's it. You guys know the rest of the Torah? All right, since we have a little bit of time, I'm going to add a few things to uh, this issue that we have in regards to doing business with Goim. Now, if you notice in your uh, Sidu, there's the uh, Ten Remembrances, and one of them is that you have to remember what Amalek did to us every day. We also have that mitzvah in Purim, which is less than two weeks away. But uh, the mitzvah of remembering Amalek is something that we have to remember every day, what he did to us, so we don't repeat what he did. Now, the Sefer uh, Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verses 13 through 16, is a uh, called Parashat Zachor. Just those verses are called Parashat Zachor. And uh, it talks about Amalek. And over there, Rashi says that uh, after teaching the laws of Anna's business and then warning that a violation of these laws, of business laws, not of anything else, violation of business laws is considered toivat Hashem, meaning someone that's dishonest in business is considered an abomination in the eyes of Hashem. Disgusting saying it street language, like us. Like, for example, if you walk across the street, and as you're walking, you see there's a nice raccoon sun tanning with his intestines out in the middle of the street because some car ran him over uh, two days ago. So it's had a nice amount of time to get uh, sun tan. And all types of maggots are coming out of him. Right now, you guys are disgusted just by my words, Right? That's much less disgusting in the eyes of Hashem than a dishonest person in business. So Rashi says, this person that's dishonest in business, it's considered toivat Hashem, is connected 
to the reminder of Amalek and what he did to us to teach us that the use of fraud with measures, dishonest business, provokes Amalek, as it says in Proverbs, deceitful scales are an abomination to the Lord. When willful wickedness comes, then comes the disgraces. So Rashi says here that when a person is willingly dishonest, not unintentional, it's honestly, it's his business, he's running a pawn shops and he's ripping people apart, telling them that their goods are worth $5. In reality, he knows they're worth a half a million on day one. He sells them something that looks like gold, tells them it's gold, but in reality, it's not even copper. He sells them brand new stuff, but in reality, it's refurbished. He uh, charges them, uh, you know, interest that's 20, 30, 40, 50 times the market rates. All types of things like this, this type of dishonesty, this type of wickedness gives power to Amalek. That's why those two things are connected, dishonesty and the whole remembering of Amalek. Because that was Amalek's nature was dishonesty. Now, the Sefer Tzrora Kesef, Aroch, it's uh, Rabbi Chaim ben Shmuel, which was a Talmud of the Rashba. In uh, in Derech Hamishi and Shar Vav Ot Aleph, he says one who lends with interest makes six love sins, six major sins: the lender, the borrower, the broker, the contract maker. We mean the sofer are all sinners. The Rambam writes. And even to lend money with interest to a goy, he says, it says that one who benefits greatly from interest, from neshech, will end up losing it to one who favors the poor. In Proverbs 28.8. So the, the Sefer Tzor Kesef says that, okay, obviously if you lend money to a Jew and charge him interest, you're making six different types of sins. You're losing all on by. You're not going to get resurrected with the dead. You're, you're the worst of the worst. But even if you're going to lo- use the leniency of lending money to a goy, because there are some that say you can lend money to a goy and charge him interest, if you're going to make money out of it to the point where you're becoming successful, just know all that money, Hashem's going to take away from you. Meaning, Hashem hates this business. Even if you want to use the leniency to do it with the person you're allowed to do it with, Hashem still hates it. Hashem still hates it. Now, what if you borrowed money from a cash advance person and you know he's sinning? You know he's sinning. So you can, you, can you just default? No, not the default. Why you borrow the money? You have to pay it back. You have to pay it back. Pay it back as soon as possible. Don't do the payments because they're going to rip you up with the, with the interest. But the point is... You have to pay back because you borrowed the money. You don't pay it back. It's gezel. It's stealing. You're also a thief. But nonetheless, a person needs to know that this business of lending and is, is Hashem hates it. Hates it. Even if you're doing it in a so-called kosher way. Now, the Yalkut Yosef Kitsur Shulchan Aruch, Yoreh Deha Siman 159, Ilchot Ribit, Seif 8, says, The Torah permits us to lend money to a goy. But only to make a living was, was, an, was the hetel made for. Meaning only to, to lend money to a goy is allowed only if it's just enough to make a living. You need three, four, five thousand dollars a month to pay your bills. That's it. You're not allowed to make a penny more. You're not allowed to get rich off of this business. Even on the permissible side. And not to become wealthy, says the Yakut Yosef says. Unless the person is a Talmud Chacham who is even permitted to, to become wealthy from it. So if a person is a Talmud Chacham, he has a little bit different rules. But how many people are Talmud Chacham in any of these uh, cash and fence places? I don't even think these people know how to read Chumash sometimes. But nonetheless, you have a serious situation. Now, Arav Yosef Shaul Natanson 
In Sefer Divrei Shaul, Ilchot Edut, Perek 2, Alacha number 5, says, A person shouldn't even lend money to a goy. If he wants to do tshuva for lending money with interest, because he must uproot the desire to lend money from the heart. So when the Torah said to lend money to a goy is a mitzvah, it also told you that you can escape from this mitzvah by not lending at all. Like one who has a mitzvah of shluach akin in the mountains, which you can avoid. Meaning, even though there's a mitzvah to go do shluach akin, which is taking the mother bird, shooing it away to take the eggs, says you have this mitzvah, you can do it in the mountains. But no one told you you have to go do it. Where well, are you going to go climb a mountain? now? So it says, yeah, it's a mitzvah to go lend the, mo- uh, the goy uh, money, but no one is saying you have to go lend them the money, though. No one is saying go do it. You could do other things. You could lend money to a Jew with no interest. But that's the problem. People forget that part. So remember, he says, remember that when you lend money with interest, there is an issue of chilul Hashem here. Meaning, even if you fulfill, let's say, the mitzvah of lending money to a goy with interest because you're allowed, because there's an etel to lend money to an interest, assuming it's fair interest, not the uh, cash advance 40-50% interest craziness. Talk about, let's say you're uh, lending him 15%, market rate, let's say. Okay? Even that, you have to be concerned because of chilul Hashem. Because that guy is going to always look at you as a Jew representing Judaism. Even if you're not religious. Even if you keep it smaller than a quarter. Even if your beard, it's only because you forgot to shave. He's still going to look at you as the Moshe Rabbeinu. And if he doesn't like how you're treating them, it becomes an issue of Chilul Hashem. You have a very serious problem on your hand. Now, he says that Uh, a person is a uh, is seriously in uh, taking a big risk, even trying to make a living out of this business. Now, is this okay? So Rabenu Bichaye, Rabenu Bichaye says his commentary on uh, in Parashat Kititze, Kititze, verse twenty-three. Uh, chapter verse 23, verse 21. He says that he mentions these two major sources that talk about ribit, interest to goyim and so on, in Masechet Makot, tw- uh, page 24a, and Bava Metziah 71a. He says all of this permission to lend money with interest is only referring to a Talmit Chacham, just to make a living. So then Rabbeinu Bechaye ben Asher continues, says, what about, what about the, uh, the verse that says, Lenochri tashich velechich alo tashich, leman yivachecha Hashem elokecha bakol, that you may cause a, uh, the Gentile to take interest, but you may not cause your brother to take interest, so that Hashem your God will bless you in uh, your everything. What about all of that? He says, the fact that it's permissible to charge a goy interest shows that it's in nature. And it's not a crime, per se, like stealing. Stealing, everybody knows that it's a, uh, you're, you're, you're not allowed. And charge, so charging interest is not like, a, uh, like, uh, like stealing. But the, the Ramban actually elaborates on this particular point, says, especially since the Torah promises a reward for not charging interest, which is not promised for not stealing. Meaning, if you don't steal, you don't get a reward. But if you don't charge interest, it says you get a reward for it. So the Torah teaches that just like Jews must give tzedakah to each other, they also must give loans interest-free to each other. But the Gentile... Uh, they don't. Uh, they're, they're not permitted. Meaning, it's not a. Uh, there's no permission to uh, to turn the, uh, the the uh, the the lending into uh, to to goyim as the mitzvah that you're doing. Needless to say, it's also there's no permission for you to turn the uh, the lending into stealing. So 
So, further on that particular verse in uh, in Leviticus twenty five, verse thirty seven. Where it says, "Et kaspecha lo titen lo beneshech ubimarbit lo titen echalecha ani Hashem." It says, "Don't give him your money for interest or for increase. Don't give uh, your food. I am Hashem." So Rashi says, "Interest is called two things here. First, it's called neshech, interest, and second, it's called marbit, which is increase. This is to show you that lending money with interest is two sins. Two sins." And the Kliyakar says, Neshech comes from the word Neshicha, which is like the bite, the biting of the borrower. Every time he takes an interest from somebody, he's like biting him. But the Marbit, the Marbit is referring to that the person is becoming rich off of other people's misfortune. So therefore, to increase the fortune of the lender is due to hurting the borrower. In essence, the reason why Hashem hates the whole business of uh, of making money with interest beyond what you need to make a living and assuming you're, you know, you're a Tomit Chacham is because the whole business of l- making money from interest is predatory in nature. You're making money off of other people's hurt, other people's pain. But then you're going to say, wait a minute, but he's borrowing the money, he's reinvesting it, and he's making money with it. Yeah, but he could do the same thing if you didn't charge him interest. Like he doesn't need you to charge him interest in order to, 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 uh, to do his business. Your interest is not helping his cause, it's hurting it. If anything, it's jeopardizing everything he's doing, not, not helping it. You're not helping his mitzvah. Don't, uh, don't live a delirious life. Now, in Exodus 22, 24, it says, when you lend money to my people, so uh, to, the pers- uh, to the poor person who is with you, don't act towards them uh, as a creditor, it says. Don't lay interest upon him. So the clear cow says, if you help the poor by giving them an opportunity to do so, Hashem helps you. And Hashem requires a person to have compassion for people that are needy, meaning that charging them interest is the opposite of being compassionate. It's a, it's a bad midah. It's a bad character trait. And that's why the prophet Yechizkel, verse eight, uh, chapter 18, verse 13, says the following, says someone who gives loans with usury and takes interest, should he live, the prophet says, he shall not live. He shall surely die and his blood is upon himself. And the Midrash Me'am Lo'ez says, this is one of the sources we use from Prophet Yechezkel, you lend money with interest, you lost Olama Ba. Because when the Prophet says, what, someone lends money, he's going to live? What does he mean live? Not live here. You think he's going to get Olama Ba? You out of your mind? He is not only going to die, but it's his fault. Why? Because he knew it was wrong. After you're in the business for a few months, you start seeing people default. You start pe- seeing people cry that they can't pay on time and so on and so forth. You're seeing the whole business is gross. You're seeing it. You have a whole file of default. You give it to somebody else and they start calling him and hounding him in the middle of the night. Sir, when are you going to pay? Start knocking on the door, sending him lawyers, doctors, this, that. P- give people heart attacks because of all this thing. So... Prophet Yechezkel says, Damav Bo is his own fault. He knows. His blood is on his own hands. Now, some people, that are the wicked people, think like Lut, who said, why put the muzzles on your sheep? Let them eat wherever they want. Because anyway, Hashem promised everything to Avram. Meaning, some people, the wicked people, they're like, listen, you're allowed to make the uh, make money from the gleam, right? So that's one reason to do it. Another reason is, if I don't lend the money, someone else is going to lend the money. So might as well be me. What's the difference? Why as well be me? So the answer to Lot is, yeah, you were right that Hashem promised the land to Avraham, but not today. Yeah, you're, there's, there is a permission to lend money to Goim, but not to you. Yes, yeah, someone's going to lend the money anyway, but it doesn't need to be you. 
doesn't need to be you. That mentality is a mentality of a rasha. So the Shulchan Aruch, Choshen Mishpat 358, Allah number 2 says, anyone who steals even a pruta, even a dollar, is violating a law of prohibition, Lotignevu, which comes from Leviticus 19.11, and must repay the money, whether it's to Israel or it's to the Gentiles, whether it's from the old or it's from the young. Meaning, stealing is forbidden from Jews and non-Jews. It's not that you're allowed to steal from non-Jews, Chash V'Shalom. Shukhan Aruch says outright, the whole issue of stealing a doll, you have to pay back, you have to pay back to Goim also. You're not allowed to take more money from them. You're not allowed to take advantage of them. Who says you're not allowed? And the commentary by the Shach says, that on this specific halacha, says this shows that stealing from a Goy is a biblical prohibition. Stealing from non-Jews is actually a Torah violation. It's not rabbinical. It's not lesser. It's Hashem puts it in the same exact class. And that's what the Marshal says, the Ramban, the Tul, the Samad, all say the same exact thing. Now there's two different types of things. There's Gneva and there's Gezil. Gneva is hidden theft. Gezil is open robbery. Open robbery. Now, if someone, for example robs a house while it's at night, no one's there, that's gneva. If he robs it during a day where everybody's there, that's gezel, robbery. It's re- gezel. What about charging interest and overcharging and things of that nature? That's considered gezel. Why is it considered gezel? Because the guy is watching you take the 40, 50, 60, 80% in, your, in his face. It's not like uh, he doesn't know that you're doing it. Yeah, but he signed the paperwork. Yeah, he signed it not realizing what kind of damage you're causing him. Everybody that signs contracts doesn't realize what kind of damage is in the small print. Everyone that signs the contract doesn't realize that they're going to be that exception that's really not an exception, that's actually more the standard. Everyone that signs a contract is overly optimistic. No one thinks that they're going to lose their whole life savings because of you and your, your strange language that you put in your language in order to take advantage of people. No one is going into this agreement with even an one ounce expectation that the worst thing is going to happen. Or that the interest that they're going to pay is going to be as much. Everybody has different situations. So the fact that he signed the contract doesn't mean it's allowed. You manipulate him into signing the contract. No, but he called me for the money. Yeah, you called. You said yes, but in reality, is you told him everything's going to work out. You didn't tell him that 90% of your clients are defaulting because of such a high interest and they're looking to... Uh, to refinance as soon as possible to, to get them out of hell that you put them into. You didn't tell him about the conversation you had five minutes before him of the mother that, uh, that is now a single mother because the, the, the father committed suicide because he couldn't make payments. And they lost the house. You didn't tell him about that part. You didn't tell him. All you told him is the, uh, the thank you letters you got from a few people just the day they got the money, not uh, by the time they paid it back. You're lying. You're lying. That's the reality. You're lying. Now the Rama in Eben Ha'ezer, Siman 28, Alakha number 1, says that if a person is a Mekadesh of a woman, meaning he took her as a wife by uh, the, instead of a ring that uh, he bought, he robbed this ring. But he robbed it from a... Uh, he robbed it from, actually, no, yeah, okay, then we'll go into this. This is a little bit deep. He robbed this ring from a goy. Is it still a valid marriage? He says, yes, it's valid marriage. Why is it a valid marriage? He robbed this ring. Aren't you not allowed to benefit from marriage? So the, the Gaon Mivina says, it's not referring, this gezel that the Ramah is referring, is talking about, is not referring to gezel that's in open daylight, but rather simply taking borrowed money from somebody and not returning it. So that's still considered gezel, but it's not the same gezel as you just mamash robbed them in, in the middle of the street and so on. And the second thing is that the Bet Shmuel uh, uh, elaborates on this point, says that really this uh, is still a valid marriage because the, uh, the woman that took the ring She's benefiting out of it, but she's, uh, she's not robbing it from the person. He gave it to her. She's a new owner. So, 
So for the people that are talking about, you know, whether is a uh, stealing from people is allowed, not allowed, you know, they're going to try to uh, use this Evan Ha'ezel, this Hamas, saying, look, you can even steal from Goyim and so on. So no, no, you have to know that there is stealing and there's stealing. There's Gezel and there's Gezel. There's different classes of Gezel. Don't try to uh, uh, misconstrue certain things or misinterpret them. Now, the Shulchan Aruch in Siman 359, Alakha number one, says that you're not allowed to rob or steal from anything, kol shehu, from Israel or an idolater. And the Yerushalmi says that midat chasidut even forbids taking a stick off of a tree or a garden that's not yours. You're walking around, you see a little, you know, your friend's uh, tree, you just like to just take off a little piece of his tree. I don't know, you just like to take off stuff of if you were trying to be someone that's really righteous, even that's not allowed. Even that's not allowed. Is your friend going to actually get affected by it? Is he going to lose sleep over it? Probably not. But if you're trying to be mamash righteous, even that's not allowed. Why? You should even pay attention to your friend's property to the extent of a leaf in his, in his, in his tree. That's really what a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants. Why? The commentary is on that. Yerushalmi says because a person, that a real Jew, is supposed to be even more stringent with the property of others, needless to say, even more stringent with Goim than he is with Jews. Meaning you should be more careful with the business dealings you do with Goim than you do with Jews. Because if you violate uh, the agreement between you and another Jew, one Jew and another, that guy's going to tell you, listen, you're a bad guy. But if you violate the agreement or ethical rules between you and a, and a, and a non-Jew, that non-Jew is going to say, ah, all Jews are bad. Meaning you've become the representative of all Judaism. And it turns into Chilul Hashem. So a person that's doing business with Goim needs to know you have to be even more stringent, more, uh, more strict, more honest with the Goim than the Jews, which is the opposite of what people's mentality is today. So what's one of the examples? The Shach says in Siman 337, Seif Katan Aleph, he says that a Jew that works for a Goy is forbidden to eat while working, even though he's allowed to eat while he's working for a Jew. Let's say you work for a Jew. You're allowed to eat during your job because you have to survive and so on and so forth, right? But if you work, while you're working even, you're allowed to eat because you're, you haven't eaten whatever. But if you work for a non-Jew, you're not allowed to eat during your job. You have to wait for your designated break time. You're not allowed to eat nothing. Why? You have to be more strict with how you work for the Goyim because he's not going to understand anything. He's going to judge all of Judaism based on you. And one, the the, 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 the Tosefta in Baba Kama says, one who steals from the Gentile must repay him just as the theft as he stole from a Jew, but you should know that the theft from a Gentile is much worse, much worse than stealing from Jews. To such an extent that the Knesset Agdolas in Siman 359 says that even stealing, you're, if stealing from a Jew, it talks about, you're not allowed to steal a puta, a dollar. He says from the, from the Gentiles, even less than a puta is forbidden. Even stealing a penny from him is forbidden. Because it's worse than stealing from a Jew, the Knesset Akadullah says. Because a Gentile doesn't forgive even for a small amount. Meaning, if you stole a dollar from your friend that's a fellow Jew, he'll let it go. Ah, it's a dollar. Okay. Whatever. It is what it is, right? But the Goy is not going to give up even for a penny. Even for a penny. Now, I told you guys a story about the uh, the guy that was stealing in the uh, newspaper in the um, in the uh, toilet paper business. It was a guy that was stealing the toilet paper business. And it's one of the clips we have on uh, on the internet. Good story, famous story. The guy that was stealing in the toilet paper business. He heard from a rabbi, "You're not allowed to steal." He did tshuva. He started giving his customers extra toilet paper from that one without them knowing, and he ended up getting rewarded handsomely by Hashem because of it. Now. Why did he do this chuba? Because he, the rabbi says that anyone that steals cannot enter Gan Eden, even if he fulfills all of the mitzvot. Jew that steals 
כן, if he keeps Shabbat, keep this, keep this, he steals, goes to Shemaim, sorry, you cannot enter Gan Eden with blood on your hands, because stealing is blood on your hands. So one of my students heard this, and she said, you know what, I borrowed a hundred dollars from my sister 15, 20 years ago. And I never paid it back. Now, after that much time, it's stealing. You didn't pay it back. It's stealing. You borrowed money and you have it to pay back. Now you don't have it. You have it. You didn't have it at the time. But you have it to pay back. You didn't pay it back. That's stealing. But all the time, it's our sister. But then she said to herself, after she heard this clip, she said, what if she didn't forgive me? What if she didn't forgive me? I'll have to come back and get gul. She says, you know what? I decided after I watched that clip, I said, there has to be a reason I'm watching this clip. I called my sister. I'm like, give me your bank account. She sent her the $100. The day she sent her the $100, her sister sent her an email with all of the receipts and all of the records she had still kept for 15 years about this $100. Meaning she was right. She never forgave her. She had receipts of all the money, where the money went, and how she still owes him, and how it got up to $100. For $100, 15 years, a sister didn't forgive it. And guess what? The, sis, the one that, bar, that lent the money, that didn't forgive, she died six, six months later. She died six months later. So that my student, she tells me, thank you for that shiu. Because if she would have died, I would have never known that this, I would have had to come back in the Gilgul for $100. Unbelievable, unbelievable how the Torah shows you how right it is. So the, the Knesset HaGadolah says it's even more forbidden to steal from a Goy to the extent where even if it's less than a dollar because the Goy is never going to forgive the Jew. Simply not going to happen. He's always going to remember you stole a penny from him. You stole 50 cents from him. You stole 90 cents from him. Don't mess with it. It's mamash lava. It's not even fire. It's lava. Rabbeinu Zalman says, even if the Goy hurts the Jew, he hit him, he punched him, he embarrassed him. Not with money, he didn't hurt him with money, but he hurt him with other things. It's still forbidden to hurt the Gentile with money loss. Even if the Goy punched him in the face and hit him, and he's uh, the worst guy in the world. Still not allowed to steal from him. Yeah, but he's a bad, he's a bad Goy. Doesn't make a difference, still not allowed to steal from him. Just because he's bad doesn't give you permission to be bad. Now, Shukhan Aruch 228, Al Khan number 6, says it's even forbidden to deceive the Gentile with Gnevat Dat. And the uh, Sefer Pitre Choshen adds that even if the Gentile will never find out that you cheated him, you're still not allowed to deceive him. Even if he's not, you cheated him, but he never, he's never going to know. Let's say, for example, he came to you and says, I want to buy kosher meat. And you sold him non-kosher meat for the price of kosher meat, which is more expensive. He's never going to know if it's kosher or it's not kosher. He's never going to know. There's no way. It's not like uh, something in the meat. He's going to know it's, it's kosher or not kosher. There's no way he's going to know. He says it's not allowed. Not allowed to even, even if he's not going to find out. Even if there's, let's say, no way for him to, for it to be a chilul Hashem. Still not allowed. And the Moldechi says, you're even forbidden to lead him astray to allow an error. This all applies to this cash advance business. Why? Because they're saying, listen, we're giving him a contract. With all the terms, we're going to charge him 40, 50, 500%, whatever it is. If he signs it, it's his problem. No. The Moldechi says, you're not allowed to lead him to a point where you know he's making a mistake. You know that no normal human being with common sense is going to sign such a contract that's going to pay interest that's simply unpayable unless the business doubles in size. It's just no one would ever do such a thing. No normal human being would do such a thing. No normal human being would sign a contract where you're pretty much putting a gun to his head where if he's late or if he defaults by payment by one month, you pretty much took over all of his possessions because of the confession of judgment part of the contract that they have. 
where guy is default on a payment by one month, in 24 hours they take over all of his possessions. No one normal would ever sign such a thing. No one normal will ever sign such a thing. And even without the confession of judgment, no one normal will sign a deal where you're going to pay him 80% if he has, uh, if he's not in desperate, uh, un, uh, unrealistic terms. So even leading him astray to allow him to make an error, the Mordechai says in his commentary in the Shulchan Aruch, says it's also not allowed. And that's why the verse in Leviticus says, uh, that you should not uh, uh, grieve your fellow because you have to you have to fear your God. This is referring to business conduct. A person is not allowed to take advantage of other people. Now the Pele Yoetz, we'll finalize with this, the Pele Yoetz says this, the Pele Yoetz in Erech Gezel says, sadly, the intentional forgetful that the, that the Gezel has become an Eter, meaning permissible, in, the, uh, in, in their eyes by charging, by changing its name, to hustling or to being shrewd because we know stealing from a goy is worse than Israel because of the Chilul Hashem. So he says that, you know, people are calling the, uh, they're stealing, they're uh, calling it, no, no, I'm just, I'm just hustling. I'm just uh, being shrewd. I'm just uh, being uh, aggressive, but, you know, as if it's allowed. He says, we all know it's not allowed. We all know it's uh, stealing from Goyim. is 100% Chilul Hashem. As the Mekubalim, like the Chida, the Arizal, and uh, the Chida mentions the name of the Arizal, and also Rabbi Chaim Pelagi in Kafa Chaim 21.7, they all say, Israel that steals from a Goy caused the Sar, the angel of the Goy, to take the Shefa, the reward that the, that, uh, that the Jews are supposed to get, they take, meaning... When a Jew steals from a Goy, he's given permission to the angel of the Goyim to take the reward of the Jews. So when you have Jews benefiting from stealing from Goyim, even if you're not the one that's stealing, you're not stealing, but there's guys in the neighborhood that are stealing. There's guys in New York that are stealing. There's guys in Florida that are stealing. There's guys that are stealing the Jewish people. They're also hurting you. Why? Those people that are stealing from Goim, they're giving permission to the angel, the Sar of the Goim, they're giving permission to take it back. Meaning, Holy Israel Aravim Zelazeh is not just in the physical form, but also in the spiritual. When we allow Jews to take advantage of non Jews, all Jews lose. All Jews lose. And that's a, uh, what, in the late 1600s, the uh, Rabbi Moshe Rivkash, the, the uh, Bera Gola, writes this. I write this for future generations because I've seen many wealthy, many wealthy men that benefited from the mistakes of the Goy, not even from stealing from Goyim. He says, I've seen many people that became wealthy from benefiting from mistakes of Goim. Lose all of their blessing and all of their money. Because sim- they didn't even take advantage of the Goim by stealing from them and so on. They just benefited on a regular basis. Every time a Goim made a mistake, they took advantage of it. They never told them. The guy gave him a change. Instead of giving him a $100 change, he gave him a $1,000 change. So he gave him 10 10s, he gave him 10 hundreds. He didn't pay attention to it. This guy loved when Goyim were making mistakes. So the Be'er Gola says, I saw some people that were rich, got rich off of those mistakes. Every time the Goyim would make mistakes, they never say a word. I saw Hashem take every single one of their dollars. All of them. As the Sefer Hasidim wrote, that those who returned the mistakes of the Goyim, 
made a Kiddush Hashem and had their wealth grow rapidly. He says, I saw the two sides. The people that took advantage of the Goyim, they ended up losing everything they have. It looked like they were getting rich in the beginning. They bought a bigger house, they got a bigger company, got a bigger building, but in the end, they lost everything. They lived like homeless people. And then the people that did the right thing, they gave the money back to the Goyim, they didn't take advantage of the Goyim, they did good, even though they didn't have much to give. They did it, in the end, they got a blessing from Hashem where they became the rich. Meaning that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves honesty to the extent that if a Jew is honest in his business, there's no question that he will have bracha. He will have bracha. And bracha, Rabotai Karim, has no, uh, no number on it. Because when you have bracha, you simply have everything you need. And there's nothing better in the world than that. I know a few people that have millions and millions of dollars, but no bracha. All of their money is being wasted on medical bills, lawyers, doctors, shemiachem, all types of divorces, all types of horrible things. They were better off not having the money. And then the few people that don't have very much, but they have almost as if like they're, uh, they're richer than anybody else. Why is that bracha? That bracha. So a person that steals, a person that's dishonest, a person that's unethical in business will never have bracha, no matter how much money he donates. So much so that the Klosenberger Rebbe said to a rich guy that came to, uh, to his Bet Midrash to donate a big money, like millions of dollars, to one of his yeshivot. When the Klosenberger Rebbe spoke to him, he says, uh, what do you do? He says, oh, I have companies, this, that, the other thing. So the Klosenberger Rebbe says, wow, so you must uh, have a very, you know, very difficult schedule. Was a very difficult schedule. He goes, no, Rabbi, I already made so much money. I'm relaxing. All my companies are making money on their own. And I just go, I play some uh, poker and uh, some cards with my friends. I go on vacation, have a good time. But thanks for caring, Rabbi. The closing of Rabbi's face changed. He looks at him. He says, Atalumit Bayesh. You're not ashamed of yourself. You're already 70 years old. And this is how you act? Well, you don't learn any Torah. Instead, you go play in a casino. Instead, you go play cards with your friends. When are you going to know Torah? What? You think you're going to... He says to him, What? You think you're going to go to heaven because you're donating money? Just so you know, he says to him. Everybody's there. So hundreds of people there watching this. So just so you know. All that money that you donated, you're going to go to Gainom for it. Why? Because that money was made from gambling. That means that those boys that benefited in that yeshiva that you paid for, that yeshiva that you paid for, those kids got the money. They were able to eat. But guess what? Those kids were not able to understand the Torah because the money was tameh. It came from an impure source. So you hurt those little boys. You didn't help them. You're going to get punished for every single one of them. You're going to get burned, he says to him. Hashem Yishmor V'yatzil. The guy's face, the billionaire's face, turned much like pale. Forget pale, it's see-through. See-through, ran out of there. Now everybody else got, you know, upset with the Rebbe. He's not usually like this. So the Rebbe, after he left, the Rebbe says to them, listen, I'm not delusional to think that he's going to stop stealing and he's going to stop gambling and he's going to change everything overnight. I'm not delusional. I know it's going to take time, but I know that from now on, I'll have a little bit of pain every time he does it. So hopefully he'll do tshuva before he dies. And it's worth it for me to give him a chance to do tshuva than getting his money to make him think that he's doing okay. If your money is coming from a non-kosher source, there's never going to be blessing in your life. Never. It's a rule in the nature that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. So, if a person is in this cash advance business or any unethical business, in the end, there's no bigger loser than you. Because even if you make money, that money will turn into a curse. Because you took advantage of people, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, it's still a sin. It's obviously 
each one has its level of sins, but nonetheless, there's no doubt, there's no dispute that overcharging goyim, taking advantage of their mistakes, taking advantage of their desperation, there are countless sources to discuss how a person is simply not only considered wicked for doing so, but is losing everything for it. Losing everything for it. In this world and the next. It's a pasul. I know this will get a few people to do tshuva and leave that business, but at the same token, we'll get a few people to uh, shut it off and uh, continue living a fake life. We don't make the shurim for the people that shut it off and continue living their fake life. We make the shurim for the few people that will do tshuva. Hopefully more and more people do tshuva, and Bezot Hashem, that despicable business will have no Jew in it. Bezot Hashem. Anything else? Yes? Ma. After he, well, okay, so he, he was leaving, and then you tell him, okay, so send me the money. And then he texts you t- saying that he's going to send you the money, and that night that he's going to send you the money. He didn't send you anything. Then he writes to you and expresses how he feels, and then you write to him and express how you feel, and he did, then the friendship ends, and you and tell him, okay, hey, you still, you know, PayPal requests. So he said he's going to say this. Forget about all the details. Okay. Give me bam tachlis. He owes you the the guy owes the money, or he should have. Or it's just a business deal, and he chooses not to do it. No, he owes Meaning, the money. He owes okay, the money. there's you, money. you gave him money, and he's yeah. supposed to pay it back, and he's choosing not to pay it back. Correct. That's the that's the bottom line. He's not. Well, he, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. He's not the rest back. of the story doesn't really matter. Tachlis, yeah. you lent the money, or you gave him money, yeah. and he's not paying it back. Correct. Okay, so what's the question? Is what is that considered stealing? You don't need to rebuke him. Oh, no? no, he already knows he's a thief. Okay, so, so you, don't, I keep, you don't ask him again, like, that's it. Like, if he's a kosher, if, I no. I don't care about the money. Listen to me, saying. listen to me, listen to me. <laughs> you gotta, listen to me. If he's a kosher Jew otherwise, meaning he's Shomer Torah and Mitzvot, then you go to a Bedin, and you sue him through the Bedin. You bring him to, they invite him into the Bedin. You prove, you, and, and he comes to the Bedin, and you show proof that he, listen to me. You go to a Bedin. The Bedin, you show, he comes to the Bedin. You show the Bedin proof that he owes you the money. And they will judge if you're right or wrong. And then will decree on him to pay you the money back right away. If he doesn't pay it back, then he's put on Cherem. He won't be allowed in any Keilah. That's if he's a kosher Jew. If he's not a kosher Jew and he rejects the invitation of the Bedin, then the Bedin will give you permission to go to court. To a regular court to sue him there. Uh, but if you are like what you said, you don't care about the money, then you should say to yourself, don't even say to him, you could say to him also, but you could for sure say to yourself, machulecha, 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 meaning I forgive the debt. You should say to him also, I forgive the debt and really forgive the debt. I forgive the debt. And the reason why you want to forgive the debt and not just not care about the debt. But forgive the debt is because if he dies tomorrow, he has to come back to life to pay you back. Now, he's not going to come back to life right away. It may take 20, 30, 40, 50 years if it even gets a chance. Which means if you're not alive at that point, you have to come back. Even if you earned Gan Eden, you're in Gan Eden, you were kept Shabbat, you kept this, you kept that, you're in Gan Eden, hanging out, chilling out, having a good time with Moshe Rabbeinu. All of a sudden, Moshe. Moshe, yeah, yeah, what, what, what do you guys want? I'm in Gan Eden with Moshe Rabbeinu, what do you guys want? No, you got to go back to the world. Why? Uh, Tzvi just came back and he has to pay you the money back, so you have to come back so he can pay you back. And you can't say Machulecha over there. So what are you doing? You owe, people owe you money? Say Machulecha, I forgive you, I forgive you, don't pay you back. So what, Only. Told him, what, what happens if you didn't know what you just said and you thought it was the opposite, like they said I confuses you and you thought that you have to be rebuking him for the money? Let's say I didn't know what you just said. What you just, what you did and till now? No problem. Now you can say, I can say okay. forgive you. I, 
Don't pay me back. I don't need the money back. I don't want the money back. You're forgiven. That's it. And if he decides to give you the money back after that, you should consider it as a gift. Not as a returning back. Thank you for learning with me. Amen.